Yes, it does. Oops, <laughs> it really does work. Well, uh, good afternoon. Um, first, before saying anything else, I have to thank uh, Ars Electronica and uh, Gerfried Stocker and, uh, and also uh, Jude at uh, Schmeiderherr because this is, a, this is my birthday present. On the 30th of May, which is my birth date, I was told that I would be chairing this session. And I can't tell you how happy I am and how, what a wonderful birthday present that is. And particularly because this session is about themes that are very close to, to me, and so uh, I'm very happy to be able to chair them and then listen to the people who are going to talk. On the face of it, there are two kinds of themes. There is one which is about controlling your data, and, uh, and the other one is about social media turning ugly, which you may have noticed, at least not all the time, but enough of the time for it to become a real problem. Fundamentally, the theme is about democracy, and what can we do to actually keep it healthy, which is not uh, very much the case for the moment. So we start with a very prestigious speaker. I say prestigious because she was brought from the United States to Canada to chair one of our most prestigious uh, scholarships and uh, research opportunity, which is uh, the Canada Research Chair, which is, she holds at York University, right? Uh, and uh, she is holding that chair in philosophy of moral and social cognition. Very deep subject. And uh, she says that we're all wrong on the internet. I first said about the internet, maybe we're wrong about the internet, but we're wrong on the internet. And uh, she wants to, to save the uh, democratic debate from social media. So uh, welcome uh, Regina Rini. Thanks very much. Thanks for that kind introduction. So, let me just get this started. So on November 12th, 2016, there were two rallies in New York City. This was a few days after the U.S. presidential election. And both of these rallies were organized on Facebook. One of them was called the Not My President Rally, opposing Donald Trump. The other one was called Support President-Elect Donald Trump. And these two rallies were held a couple miles apart. And then at a certain point, according to news reports, the anti-Trump rally began marching up Fifth Avenue until it encountered the pro-Trump rally right outside of Trump Tower. And there was not a polite interaction. It was an unhappy event. What nobody involved knew, no one on either side of this rally, what no one knew was that the rallies had actually been organized, at least in part, by the same people. The same people put up these Facebook ads for both rallies, the pro- and anti-Trump rallies. And according to the United States Justice Department, he also has a Facebook page, but it was less popular than the fake one that was utilized by the operatives in St. Petersburg. There was also a group called Blacktivist, which was a mirror of Black Lives Matter or of racial justice campaigners. Again, it was run out of St. Petersburg. Both of these fake sites and, and several others, about 30 others, were used according to the US Justice Department for the purpose of spreading distrust toward the candidates and the political system in general. Now this was big, big news in February of this year. It was big news in Canada where I live. I imagine it was big news in Europe as well. And it was especially big news in the United States. And so what I was interested in was the way that hearing about the use of bots and uh, fake pages on social media, hearing about how that affected how Americans engage in political debate with one another online. And so I started looking for examples. So I'm going to show you some examples. These are from uh, public Facebook pages of news media in the week after the news came out. And as it happened, there was a big news event and a debate that week. That same week, a young man took weapons into a high school in, in, uh, in uh, Parkland, Florida, and attacked some former classmates and students. And this reignited debate in the United States about what to do about guns. So on these public Facebook pages, people began arguing, what should Americans do about guns? So for example, here's someone named RJ, 
who is arguing that there should not, in fact, be gun control because you couldn't stop the shooter. You don't have to worry too much about exactly what RJ says. The, example, the point is just that here's RJ giving RJ's opinion. And someone named John responds to RJ with a message in Russian, apparently. If you can't read Russian like me, you could, you could use Facebook's translation program. And what it tells you is that John said, your check by mail, comrade. That same week, on another website, this is the CBS News website, there were further debates about gun control. Here's a different person named John saying, basically giving a conspiracy theory. Again, the details don't matter too much. You don't have to read the whole thing. The idea is just here's a conspiracy theory about how this is secretly Obama and the FBI perpetuating attacks to encourage gun control. And somebody else responds to this with, the Russian bot is strong in this one. So you have several different people who see someone else making an argument, a political argument, whether or not you agree with it isn't the point, making a political argument and dismissing it on the grounds that it's just a bot. And the really scary thing is they weren't totally wrong to be thinking this way. From that very same week, here's a BBC article, there were in fact that very same week, February of 2018, this year, there were Russian bots active on Twitter and social media engaging in spurious arguments about gun control to try to drive division in American politics. One last example of this phenomenon. This is another thing on, on the Fox News Facebook page, and this is a person talking about their own personal opinions about President Trump. And, um, and so this is this, someone's personal opinion about Donald Trump. You don't have to read the whole thing. The point is that here is a discussion of what somebody thinks of Donald Trump. And then in response, a whole lot of people add their opinions. Troll, troll, oh look, a Russian troll, shh, troll, go away, oh look, a deep state shrill, and Brian is not real, paid troll. So we have this over and over again. This is all in the same week, just in one week. On, these are public comments on social media, and they're all around this same theme. And this theme goes back to something that's been in the internet from the beginning. You might recognize this, a very famous New Yorker cartoon from 25 years ago. The caption is, on the internet, no one knows you're a dog. The other problem we have now is that on the internet, no one knows you're not a bot. Anybody who disagrees with you, who thinks you're wrong, who thinks you're making a mistake, doesn't have to engage with your opinion if they can dismiss it as just being a bot, or as being a fake account, or as being a troll. So we're at this really difficult stage with social media discourse, which might have been a great political tool for people to be, having, be able to have all kinds of conversations and be able to have political debate across an entire country, where instead, social media is driving us towards dismissing other people's opinions. So I'm, I'm a philosophy professor. I think about these things in terms of philosophical theories, and I wanted a framework for thinking about this. So I'm going to borrow a framework from the British philosopher Bernard Williams. This is from a paper about 30 years ago. Williams talks about three different conceptions of what politics could be, and he focuses, helpfully for us, around the idea of making errors and mistakes. The question is, how do we react to other people when we think they've done something wrong, when we think they're wrong about something? And he thinks that our reactions to other people are what constitute or structure what our political system is like. So one type is what he calls the politics of mere control. And the idea here is when somebody makes a mistake, they have to be fixed, like they're a leaky faucet or a broken down car. Just fix them no matter what it takes. He calls this a, a politics fit for slaves or servants. His second, his second idea is the politics of acknowledgement. And the politics of acknowledgement says people can make mistakes and maybe we have to give them a chance to excuse themselves and fix their behavior, but in the end they still have to do what we tell them to do. Maybe we temporarily give them a, a chance to fix themselves, but in the end they have to do what we say. And he calls this a politics fit for, fit for subjects, like with a king or an autocrat. And the third type is the politics of communal deliberation. The idea here is in the politics of communal deliberation, when I disagree with somebody, when I think you're doing something wrong, when I see you're violating a rule, you get to disagree with me back. You get to say, no, the rule shouldn't be that way. I'm not just wrong, I disagree. I think the rule should be changed. Maybe you're the one who's wrong. It's only this last conception that's a democratic conception of politics and how we handle error. It's that we all have to allow that when we disagree, there's some room for pushback. The other person can say to us, I disagree. So I want to use this framework to think about what social media is doing to us. And I want to suggest there's at least three different ways in which social media is changing us, pushing us away from this ideal politics of communal deliberation. We take other people's disagreements seriously. Okay, so I'm going to walk through a couple of different ways I think this is happening. The first one I've already talked to you about, this is what I'm calling the lost presumption of sincerity. It's the way in which if you disagree with somebody, you can just announce they're a troll or announce they're a bot. They're not someone you really have to engage with. They don't matter to the debate because they're not even real. Second problem here 
is what I call the entertainmentization of discourse. This is where we treat what's supposed to be a serious discussion about how to decide our politics together as just an opportunity for entertainment or for money. So the idea here is that traditional media, radio, TV, made money off of passive receivers. We sit there and we, we listen and we watch, and advertisements are fed to us, and money's made off of advertisements while we watch and pay attention. Social media makes money off of active engagement. Social media requires, in fact, it benefits the most when we all are constantly actively participating, when we are posting angry comments or clicking the like button or the unhappy face button. We're doing something. It's the us doing something that keeps social media going, and that's what makes money for social media companies. Roger McNamee, who was an earlier investor in Facebook, talked about this in New York Magazine. He said they're basically trying to trigger fear and anger to get the outrage cycle going because outrage is what makes you be more deeply engaged. You spend more time on the site and you share more stuff. Therefore, you're going to be exposed to more ads and that makes you more valuable. It's the anger, it's the engagement that drives the value of social media, not necessarily the quality of what you're saying. Here's an example of this from that same week in February regarding the gun control debate in the United States. These are two journalistic publications. The one on the left is the National Review. The National Review is a conservative publication, but it's widely respected across the aisle in the United States. It's seen as a mainstream conservative publication that obeys standards of journalistic ethics and is generally regarded as, as thoughtful. The publication on the right is Breitbart. If you haven't heard of Breitbart, it's a, what was, used to be regarded as a very fringe, extreme uh, publication. Its former editor is Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's once close advisor, and it tends to engage in excitable and often not quite true discourse. So both of these publications are talking about what role the survivors of the Parkland shooting had in national gun control debates. And the National Review took a conservative stance, but a reasonable stance, a thoughtful stance. Whereas Breitbart engaged in some conspiratorial thinking. It even indulged the thought that maybe there had been no shooting and they were quote unquote crisis actors who were paid to pretend to have been at a shooting. Now, if you look at the engagement figures on these two posts, you see something interesting. That's the lower left-hand corner. I don't know if you can see the numbers. The number of people who responded to the National Review sober reporting is 366. The number of people who respond to Breitbart's more excitable reporting on the same topic is 8,000. 366 to 8,000. It's writing the more excited and anger-inducing stuff, the stuff that gets you pressing the anger button or writing something about it or sharing it to your friends and saying how terrible this is. That's the stuff that gets the attention and that's the stuff that, gets, that generates money for advertisers on social media. So that's the second problem. The third problem is what I'm calling an eroding norm of testimony. I have to explain a bit what I mean by this. And in case you're interested, this is coming from a paper I wrote, so if you're curious, if you want to read more about this, you can read this paper. So when I say testimony, I don't mean like legal testimony in a court of law. I mean the way philosophers use the term. We talk about testimony as just ordinary day-to-day -day talking to other people. And it basically, the idea is I get information from hearing you tell me what you saw or what you heard happen. And the idea here is that I, might, I need to rely on what other people tell me happened for most of what I know about the world. I wouldn't have very much knowledge of the world if I only knew the things that I personally observed. And so we are very heavily dependent, all of us, on trusting others' testimony. But for this to work, we have to have some norms. We have to believe that people are sincere, they mean what they say, and they're competent. They know what they're talking about. We have to believe that. And norms are how we hold people accountable. If people talk about things they don't know about or if they lie, we hold them accountable for their bad, act, bad practices of testimony. I take it that that's, that's how we used to do things. That's how most face-to-face -face conversation still works. But that's actually not true on social media to an increasing extent. And you can see this if you can think about the Twitter slogan. A retweet is not an endorsement. A retweet is just tweeting back out something someone else tweeted. And a retweet is not an endorsement as you saying, oh, I don't really, I don't necessarily agree with this. I'm just, without comment, putting it back out there for other people to read over again. Okay, so a retweet is not an endorsement, is a suggestion that I'm not responsible for this thing I'm passing along to other people. We can see an example of this from this tweet by Donald Trump. This is before he was the president. This is about three years ago, but it was during the campaign. And what's key in this tweet is a link he has at the bottom. And this link, if you follow it through, goes to the following infographic, alleged US crime statistics. I want you to focus on this one right here that claims that 81% of all whites killed in the United States are killed by blacks. This is a lie. This is a made up statistic. Some reporters investigated and tracked it down to a white supremacist website. There is no data behind this whatsoever. It is just flatly a lie. 
So when Donald Trump was questioned, why did you tweet out this thing that is inflammatory, white supremacist nonsense, his response on Fox News was, am I gonna check every statistic? All it was was a retweet. It wasn't from me. The idea is, when you're retweeting, you're not responsible. All you're doing is just passing it along for other people to think about. But the problem here is that we still have some remnants of non-social media testimony. We still think that when people pass on information to us, when they share a piece of news, that they're telling us, oh, I kind of checked this out, I trust it. We, seem to, we, we treat it half as if people are reliable when they pass on fake news or any other piece of news. And then we also, at the same time, don't hold them accountable in the same way when it turns out to be a lie. And that's a problem. It's eroding the expectation that the discussion we have with each other on social media is responsible to being true and responsible to being competent. So I want to claim that these three things working together are a loss of trust in the sincerity of others, or willingness to treat them as bots or trolls, the fact that the social media platforms make money off of us getting angry, and the fact that we are increasingly less assuming, we, we, we less require that people are truthful and honest and know what they're talking about on social media. All these things are working together, I think, to pull us back from this norm, this politics of communal deliberation that Bernard Williams laid out, where, what's, where in order to have a politics, we have to uh, allow people to argue with us and disagree with us. Once we've pushed to a point where we don't really expect people to tell the truth, and we don't even treat them as real people, they're just bots, and we just don't care all, the whole thing is about fighting on the internet, then increasingly we don't have a politics of communal deliberation. We have, at best, a politics of acknowledgement where people are expected to do what we say, and at best, we'll give them some time to shape up before we punish them for it. Now, what can we do with this? My last few minutes, I want to talk to you about some ideas I have, some suggestions for what I think we can do to improve things, to make our, make our, our social media discussion better and closer to a genuine politics of communal deliberation. And I want to suggest that the responsibility here is primarily on us, on the users of social media. In the end, we're the ones who have to shape up and have to behave better. But it's unreasonable to expect us to do it all ourselves. What I want to suggest is that what we need is for the social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter and other social media sites, to provide us with tools, what I'm calling deliberation infrastructure, that help us remember that what we're doing is engaging with other people, and remember that it's important to engage with them as fellow citizens in a democratic society. And the model here is just very simple things, like the pavement lines on a public walkway that tell you one side is for walking, one side is for cycling. The lines don't force you to do anything, they can't stop you, but good people who mean well will generally obey them because it's better to make everything work out and not crash into each other all the time. So what I want is for the social media platforms to give us similar guidelines, to give us just subtle things that help us to behave better without forcing us to do anything. So let me give you two examples of this. One of them I'm borrowing. This comes from a uh, creative agency called IA, a design agency. I'm just borrowing this from them. I encourage you to go take a look at their website and look at this in more detail. But their suggestion is that we use formatting on social media, particularly on Twitter, to be able to identify trolls. So, I'm sorry, not trolls, bots. Bots, you can identify bots. So you can use computer science methods to detect pretty reliably who's a bot and who's a real person. And the idea is that bots post at a particular frequency, at a particular speed, that's distinctive of non-humans typing. And so Twitter has a pretty good idea already, or at least it could have a pretty good idea, of who are likely to be the bots and who are real people. And Twitter could just automatically display that information to all of us by changing the formatting. They could use a different font. So that's the example here. Things that are detected by Twitter are likely to be posted by bots appear in a different font than things are po likely posted by people. It would be a very simple change. It wouldn't force anyone to do anything differently. You'd still see everything you wanted in your feed, but there'd be a little cue there to help you identify what's likely coming from a bot and what's likely coming from a real person, and that would help gauge your responses. Second example has to do with Facebook and fake news. So right after the US presidential election, Facebook announced that it was going to do a new thing where when you posted a story, if independent fact checkers said it was disputed and might be fake news, then they would give you a little box saying, are you sure you really want to post this? And you could still do it. They wouldn't stop you, but you had to click the box first. After a year, Facebook took that down. They said that feature didn't work, and they tried something different where they started posting alternative stories next to all disputed stories. But I think that Facebook ought to have stuck with its original plan. I think that was actually a good idea, asking people to click through if they wanted to post disputed stories. And I think they should have gone one step further. I think they should have recorded data on who did that. I think they should have kept track of who still shared things, even after being warned that it was disputed. And I think they should have given us a subtle 
display of how often people share things like fake news. So it, all I'm imagining here is this little dot next to your name and next to your icon. And then maybe it's green if you haven't been sharing fake news, and it's yellow if you do sometimes, and it's red if you have a history of repeatedly sharing fake news. Now there's lots of worries you might have here. You might say, who decides what's fake? Facebook's answer is they go to independent fact checkers. You might worry, is this kind of surveillance? That's a fair worry too. Here's the problem though. It turns out Facebook is already doing a lot of this. So just a month ago, there was an expose in the Washington Post. In fact, Facebook is doing most of what I just said. It is, in fact, keeping track of how all of its individual users interact with fake news on the platform. It's a little bit more subtle here. It has to do not with what you share, but with what you react to and what you try to label as fake news. But the point is Facebook is keeping track of this data, but it's not sharing it. It's not transparent. You can't get your own score. You can't get other people's scores. And I'm suggesting that Facebook already has this information. If it shared it with us, if it showed us those little colored dots next to people's names, then it would give us a starting point for thinking about, is this person who has a track record of being responsible? This would not be censorship. It wouldn't stop anyone from posting anything they want to. But it would just give us that little bit, that infrastructure that lets the rest of us have a sense of who we're interacting with when we engage with strangers on the internet. My hope is that by having these kinds of bits of infrastructure, the little, the changing format for bots, and maybe the little indicator of people who've shared fake news in the past, gives us a way of mentally checking. Not everybody you're engaging with is lying to you or is a robot. A lot of people are real, ordinary people who just disagree with you on the internet. So my hope is that this kind of infrastructure gives us a way of sorting mentally in very quickly while we're engaging with people on the internet so we can engage with them as citizens who disagree with us, not just as obstacles to our being able to have a good time on the internet. And hopefully if that sort of thing works, then we'll be closer to realizing the internet and realizing social media as a source of democracy rather than something getting in the way. Thank you. Thank you, Regina. That was really a, an eye-opener. Uh, <laughs> I really did learn something about how social media actually. Um, a question before you go is, was, to what extent did Twitter know that it was going to go that way before it finally started to help? Oh, so Twitter hasn't implemented the formatting thing yet. Oh, not yet? No, that, that was a suggestion made by an independent agency. Twitter has not actually implemented that. Subsidiary question, to what extent do you trust uh, Mark Zuckerberg? Tr I'm sorry, trust what? Mark Zuckerberg and and Facebook? That's such a good question. I, I've never met him. I don't know what he's like. I'm told that he wants to do really well, but he also has complicated views about what a good thing is. He's very concerned with not censoring anyone, and sometimes that means he makes choices <laughs> that aren't the best. Good. Thank you. I, I, I feel a bit like you. I just wanted to say, but uh, you can uh, take your seat if you'd like, but I was very interested in your uh, description of the politics of control. Uh, it reminded me the one of the... Um, Politic of control. I don't know if you ever ran into Zainab Tufekci. She is a sociologist from the United States, and she's write, written a brilliant article. And she calls that whack a protest. When you get a, when you, you know, what's happened in Turkey, evidently, and she is from Turkish origin. She talks about when there is a protest, you just ignore the content and you just whack them all and out of space. The other one is the uh, the other thing that I thought about about uh, recovering. Uh, control of political debate is being practiced right now in a very interesting way in Taiwan. I don't know if you re uh, read about Taiwan TV, it's called TV Taiwan, but it's not about television. It's about how people have been able to create use platform to actually relate to the government on things like allowing or not allowing Uber or allowing under certain circumstances and reconciling very strongly opposed position by finding what are the common points and then eventually leading from these common points into something that actually is, can be helpful to everybody. So that's an example of, yes, maybe we have a chance of uh, recovering control of the political debate. Thank you very much. <laughs> so now... <clears throat> Now we're going to listen to Ernst Hafen, who is a geneticist. Um, and uh, he says that we should reclaim possession and control of our own data. Uh, GDPR doesn't seem to quite do it, although it's on the way to helping us to this, you know, the regulation about data control from the European Commission. 
Uh, but he has ideas. He has a very uh, ingenious and quite Swiss way uh, to, of, of creating a cooperation called Midata. Made me think of Migro, which is one of the great cooperation of selling goods in Switzerland. He will also uh, explain to us how to escape or maybe avoid what he calls digital feudalism. So let's hear Ernst Hafen. If, oh, there he is. <laughs> You're equipped. <laughs> okay, thanks very much for the invitation. I must say it's always hard to follow as a biologist, a philosopher uh, uh, in a talk, but you made such a strong argument for digital feudalism just now that I think uh, we are uh, entirely in line and we all know that we are basically by downloading smartphone apps for free we're giving away data we are giving our profiles away to Google to Facebook and I'm sure Google knows more about your health at the moment than your doctor does already now and so this digital feudalism is going to increase dramatically. While we pay for coffee here outside in the restaurant, no question, we never think of paying for a digital service. We pay with our data, right? And that has led in the last 10 years to this sort of digital dependency. I only realized this when 10 years ago, as a geneticist, I'm interested in genome. Your Genome is unique. Every one of you has a unique genome. It consists of six billion letters of code. This is the biological language, and each of us differs in one in a thousand of these letters. That's all the difference there is. And see the difference in faces and, and, and statues, etc. that uh, has a lot to do with what is in our genome. And understanding how these small differences translate into the phenotypic differences that we see, how we react to drugs, to medications, etc., that is really a challenge. And that is a challenge that actually needs a lot of people, data from a lot of people. So, in 2008, I got really excited by the call of 23andMe, this Google spin-off company, who said, you as a citizen scientist can participate with your genome data to understanding disease. And this is my family, and so in 2008, I offered them as a Christmas present their genome analysis. Has any one of you analyzed their genome here? None. So, well, I've got news for you. In five to ten years, all of you will have your genome sequenced fully, because the next time you go to the, uh, to the hospital, there is so much information about how you respond to drugs that the doctor will, uh, will order this, and it's going to be much cheaper than an MRI. It now costs about $1,000. The, the, the version I did costed about $200 at the time. But what I realized is that I'm giving my genome data away to this for-profit company, and they're making lots and lots of money. They're making hundred millions uh, deals with pharmaceutical company based on our data. And I said, well, it's not only genome data, it's all the fitness data, etc. How can we reconcile that? Is there not a better way to manage our data? Shouldn't we not make the profits as a society? Not we as an individual, but as a society. And you see this beautiful beach, it's not where I was on, uh, on vacation this summer, but I'd like to take this beach as an image for, say, global public health, for example. To understand public health and to describe this beach in detail, you have to know all the sand grains. And the sand grains are each of us with all our data, genome data, medical history, etc. Now, the beach doesn't change if your data set is not there. So each sand grain in itself is irrelevant, but it's the sum of all the sand grains that makes the beach, and the sum is society, and so the profits should not go to the shareholders of these companies, but they should go back also to society. And that is sort of where the cooperative, citizen-owned cooperative approach comes about. 
And this is only going to be going to be worse because now artificial intelligence is going to be much more much more strongly involved in diagnostics not only in medicine also in education etc and those companies or those countries that have the most data will have the lead and there was a new new york times article last year saying that the global dominance of china and the us in artificial intelligence is such that every local hospital in germany will have to subscribe to ai diagnostic services so how can we get out of this and i think we have a chance because we have the right to control our own data and if we find a way to combine not only the way we deal with our data, but actually that we as individuals with our supercomputers engage in this, in a fair data governance, I think we have a chance to sort of uh, break this global dominance. And I will tell you how we are approaching this. Because it goes down to three features that personal data have that are unique, they're called a new value or a new asset or the oil of the 21st century, first of all, they can easily be copied. Your doctor has to keep your record for 10 years, but you can get a copy of that. At least in Switzerland, you're allowed to. They can easily be copied, and I can do with a copy what I want. Secondly, it's an asset that's uniquely equally distributed amongst people. Because in genome data alone, we're all billionaires. I told you we have six billion letters in our genome. And that is true for every woman in Tanzania and every woman in Ghana as well. And the number of steps we take, the number of heartbeats we have, it's an entity that is very similarly distributed in contrast to money and all the other resources, uh, values that we have. And thirdly, and most importantly, you are the maximal aggregator of your data. Google knows a lot about you, but Google does not have your medical record, and it cannot have your medical record until, unless you send it to them. It does not have your genome, because that's probably then stored in the hospital. But you have a right to combine all these data together. And it is the combination of different data sets on the individual that is where the value is. So, we, by, cop, by generating an ecosystem of these data copies under the individual's control, we can actually gen, generate much more value and insight than the companies can do now. And here is the great thing of GDPR. May 25th was a milestone in the empowerment of the individual. And very few people realized Article 20, read it in the GDPR, says data portability. Every citizen has the right to a digital copy of all his or her personal data. That's data portability. That's in there that can be enforced to get a copy of your Facebook record, of your medical record, of your genome record, and aggregate it. Now, obviously, you say, this is too complicated. What can I do with this? But this is, think about it. In the Middle Ages, people thought, the feudal lords thought, we cannot give our serfs money for a salary because they don't know how to handle this. They will go into the next restaurant and spend it all, right? Nowadays, the entire economy works because each of us has a bank account and we spend or invest our money in different ways. And in 10 years from now, we also ha will have each of us a personal data account and we will share and invest it the way we want it, for medical research, for whatever. And GDPR allows you to do this, and Mark Zuckerberg already announced that he would be compatible with the European GDPR. Uh, Tim Cook did the same. There is a big drive towards this uh, digital empowerment. And this is not only about uh, medical data. This is our niece, Smila, four years old at the time. Think about your children right now. Do you see what she's doing? This is not a posted picture, this is a real picture. She's playing on an iPad. Every swipe this Smila does from now on until she's 18 or 20 and maybe considering coming to ETH for a study is recorded somewhere. 
and she is profiled with Khan Academy, with Coursera, but with every game that she does, any, someone profiles her. That's the reality now. That's true for every of your children. If she has a copy of all these data together in her data account, she will have an education profile, again, a maximal aggregator because she has kindergarten, uh, elementary school, and high school in there as well, that is much more detailed than the notes or the grades she has in the exams or in the final, uh, in the final diploma. So personal data, personal education data will result in personalized education much in the same way that we talk about personal medicine now. Very few people talk about that. So, but the opportunity is that we can actually engage in this process with the copies of our data. This is the blue square represents these two billion hours that people watch television in the United States per year, two billion hours. Now, you see the little square, very, very small, is 100 million hours that it took to build Wikipedia. So that's what we call the cognitive surplus that is in society. If we engage more in citizen science for any aspect that we, that we like, I think there is a lot we can do. No, no one of us would have thought that Wikipedia could be realized. It has been realized because people want to contribute, they do it, they can correct themselves, and because they don't get financial incentives to, pay, uh, to do it. So I think there is a great surplus. There is actually a human right to do science. These uh, citizen science platforms like Zooniverse show how millions of people contribute to all kinds of tasks, identification of animals or, or patterns, etc. And people want to contribute, they need agency, and they will also redefine science. Because I'm as a researcher want, you know, maybe your genome data to do a research project. And you say, okay, you can have it, but you will also give it to her because she's my competitor, but you want a solution to your uh, health issue, and I want a publication, so I want exclusive rights. That's not in your interest. So I think that will change the way we, we accredit science and how we do science. So the challenge, of course, is how to, do we rebalance this socioeconomic asymmetry in this data-driven uh, economy? And the way we can do it, we go back to the three unique features of personal data. First of all, that data can be easily copied, that it allows us to generate a parallel ecosystem. We don't close down Google. I don't want to close down Google. I don't want to close down Twitter. I like them, but I want to generate a parallel ecosystem under the control of the individual. If we manage these data in these data cooperatives that are not for profit because the, the value should go back to society and not to the individual member, because it's the sand beach, sand grain analogy, but the cooperative is democratically controlled by the one member, one vote. And that fits so well to the fact that we have similar amounts of personal data. And lastly, because we have the greatest aggregation power, this will generate so much value that Facebook will come to us and we will pay for the services like we pay for the coffee outside, but then the data stay under, under our control. So this is not just the concept, we've published about this, but it's actually a reality. So Midata is the cooperative that we founded in 2015. Basically, it's a new platform, a cloud-based, secure data storage platform where every record, whether it is your genome, the, the steps that you took today are encrypted individually. It's only you who have the key for that, and you decide with whom you want to share it whether you want to participate in a clinical uh, uh, project or whether you want to download an app that allows you to, to uh, uh, train for, uh, for the Berlin Marathon, for example, using data that stay in your account and that are then not sold. Because the ethics committee that is also uh, elected by the General Assembly is looking at those general terms that the data cannot be sold to third parties. 
So it will generate an entirely new ecosystem for data services, because data that have never been together, like genome data, medical data, and, and, and shopping data, for example, can now come together. And that, you don't know what to do with it, but there will be hundreds of services that you can use to visualize this data. It will allow you to visualize your digital footprint from all the Facebook tweets and likes you do, and you say, hmm, maybe I should turn down my privacy or turn up my privacy for Facebook, etc. So it will make you literate about data as we have become literate about money by getting pocket money when we were kids. So this is not a Swiss thing. Of course, we, we like democracies, we like cooperatives, but this is something that we can do everywhere because the needs of citizens and the patients are the same everywhere. So any application that runs on this Swiss cooperative can also run on a, on a German cooperative. And so these are our co current partners. So we're building, uh, helping them to build mid cooperatives in Germany, in the Netherlands, Belgium, and in the UK and hopefully also in Ghana, Tanzania, in every country. Because it empowers citizens, it gets the value, and this value, mind you, think about the valuation of Amazon or Google, is huge, because it's already billions now. If you combine it with the data that have not been combined, medical data, it will be much larger. So it will go back to society, and it will be a great source, especially also in low- and middle-income countries. So finally, I think this is the opportunity for Switzerland and Europe to sort of change this uh, digital dependency from these multinational companies. And I also can quote a philosopher, John Rawls, because John Rawls in the 1970s said that the fairest way of a democracy is a property-owning democracy. A property-owning democracy where every citizen not only has a political vote, like in Switzerland, in, in, in Germany, and in the United States, but those that have the money make the largest campaigns. We know it also from Switzerland. But that in addition to the political vote, he or she also has an economic vote. In the 70s, this was called, yeah, you want to have redistribution of wealth. This doesn't work. But now we have uncovered our personal data as a new asset. A new asset that only we can actually maximally control. So we do have a strong economic vote in the future, and that is, I think, a, a way to realize John Rawls' property-owning democracy. And I hope that we in Europe can take the lead here and change this, thanks also to the GDPR. I don't think people who made the data portability article realized what pot potential this has for, for the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Hafen. It was a very, again, very good uh, presentation of things which are news to me. But I'd like to ask you a few questions. We have a minute. One of them is about the GDPR, and I'm so pleased that you brought it out, and, and it justly deserves your praise. Um, but do we have access to our criminal record on GDPR? That, I don't, I think it's personal data. You can get, you, uh, you, you can, in Switzerland, certainly, you can get a, a, a printout of your criminal record. You can, yeah. even without GDPR? Yes. That's a very, that's a very Swiss thing. <laughs> we are, excuse me about that. I, I thought it was actually a it's very not good. <laughs> it, it's not excluded in, in, in GDPR data portability. No, no, no. It's, no, it's yeah. personal. Um, regarding the, um, your, your presentation about the amount of data that are collected about us, um, made me think about what's going on in Singapore. In Singapore, uh, the collection of data about education resembles quite closely what you were presenting with the young girl. Uh, and that allows them 
totally feudal, <laughs> feudal system, that allows them to decide which school you'll go to, when you can actually, it's not just your exams that you have passed successfully or not that decide whether you can go to the next level, but it's in fact the data they have accumulated upon you. And that's a very strong control of, pe of people. And what you're proposing, in fact, when you talked about the new uh, social contract, is that what you meant by the property-owning democracy? How do you see a new social contract? Well, I see it in contrast to the Singapore or the, the Chinese uh, mm -hmm. system where basically the government just collects all the data and then says which girl should go to which school. In our system, we are in control. And mm -hmm. I don't have, on, if, you have a, if I have an account on, on, on Midata, I don't have to share this data with anyone. Okay. I only decide to share it if I see a benefit. Maybe for my child to select, you know, what she should do or so, or Smilla, etc. But it's me. That's the difference. It's each of us who decides. And on, on, the, on our bylaws of the cooperative, we cannot even access anonymized data because we don't think anonymization exists in the world of genomes and, and social media data anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's only you who has the key to the data. You share it with whom you want. You participate in what projects you want or you download the apps and services you want. Beyond the, social, the new social contract, do you also see this as a new form of economy? Oh, yes. I think Can I sell my data? That's a, very good, that's a very good question. And there are plenty of platforms where you can sell your data to the highest bidder. I'm, we are very explicit about that, that on our platform you don't sell the data. Because it's not your data that is very valuable, it's again the beach, and that should go back to society. It's the same argument that in, in Europe you don't get paid for donating blood. Mm -hmm. In the United States you get $40 for donating blood. It's of course all, only the homeless people who go donate blood because they need the money. And if you start paying people for their data, they will start to fake data. They will put the fitness mm -hmm. tracker on their dogs and all kinds of things, right? right? Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the answers also and for your wonderful talk. Um, and now the third and last <laughs> speaker. The third and last speaker in this se uh, session is Ariana Dongus, and she is a writer and a researcher based in Berlin, but a uh, PhD candidate in uh, the uh, Hochschule für, Gest uh, für Gestaltung in Karlsruhe. And she's particularly a member of KIM, a research group in critical studies in machine intelligence. So her intriguing title is the camp as labor laboratory with very interesting play on word. Uh, it's not about boot camps, uh, but it's about much graver kind of camp. It's a refugee camp where there again, people are taking data without permission. Am I right saying this? Yes, yes. All right, please go. Thank you Thanks. <laughs> Hi, hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here speaking and um, I was invited to speak about biometrics, that is uh, the scanning of eyes and humanitarian aid. So to be here talking about this topic is a matter of great responsibility as people from African and Middle Eastern countries become once again a target and a projection screen in uh, Western countries in the form of the enemy in the form of the terrorist threat as xenophobia and as blunt racism. So, what does it mean to speak about humans by using the word refugee? The figure of the refugee ident identifies humans with the flight. The datafication of refugees turns them into digitized data sets. We have to be aware of what this means. It is a practice that works with, with statistical modeling techniques. It involves quantification, classification, and the construction of individuals and of populations that can be then managed. These constructed categories are never impartial or objective, but rather embedded in specific, local, and differing socio-political contexts. 
Humans are being made refugees by external events. It's not a natural or biological fact. These people are the undesirables, as anthropologist Michel Agier calls them. The unwanted, rejected and displaced people of this world. The camps also fulfill the function of keeping people away from the wealthy nations. As the EU-Turkey deal, deal has made very clear. The definition of the refugee status is obviously political and the place of constant struggles over who is deserving and who is not. Very carefully, one must not fall into the trap of generalizations and problematize the politics around the term refugee and likewise digital refugee aid. Different from earlier politics of humanitarian aid and especially since the post 9-11 era, refugees are being constructed as suspicious figures who consume a service rather than making use of their right to find shelter. Often, this symbolic figure of the refugee moves very close to the figure of the illegal or the terrorists, meaning that national security and migration have been brought in close connection. It makes it, for instance, possible to say, if the European migration management and border systems are too weak, it endangers the security and the safety of the European countries and its citizens. It is in this political climate that biometric registration then needs to be looked at, I think. So, the eyes don't lie. There's two questions I want to discuss here. One, is biometric registration really fortifying the human rights awarded to refugees, as the UNHCR claims? Two, which desire is connected with registering people? Let's look at the case of Jordan now, about which my colleague Christina Zuneden and me have done research that we published in the German newspaper Die Zeit. IrisGuard cooperates with the UN Refugee Agency. The company delivers the algorithm, the interface and the hardware to perform iris recognition in refugee camps. Since 2013, all people arriving in the Jordanian camps, such as Zatari or Azraq, must register their irises. With the new digital and perfectly neoliberal strategy of the UNHCR to implement biometric registration in their camps, they have installed around 300 registration sites worldwide and scanned more than 2.5 million refugees in their public-private partnership with IrisGuard and many other vendors of biometric scanners. Back to Jordan now. Produced in an automated way, the barcode of the iris is uploaded to a cloud server named iCloud. From that moment, identities could be automatically recognized from any location in the world that houses these biometric machines, if there is a desire to do so, of course. That could happen in the form of being even remotely at a checkpoint or at an airport, for instance, and without the individual's knowledge. Thus, the UNHCR databases can potentially track, tag, monitor and predict their movement. The mode of data mining is compulsory since receiving food and relief aid is in large parts distributed through cash-based assistance their scanned irises now replace cash or bank cards. The iris scans are also used for a system of cashless payment. The majority of refugees in Jordan live outside the camps in urban areas. They receive cash through iris scans directly through bank ATMs. In the camp, again, people buy their food at the camp's own supermarkets and pay with a wink of the eye. Iris scanners replace cash or credit cards. This biometric data is available for UNHCR and the World Food Program. In fact, the World Food Program uses this data for real-time consumer behavior assessment. It must be at one point also shared with the bank that is running the ATMs, the Cairo Amman Bank, for example, among others. The consumer data in the camps is as made is, um, is made available to the grocery retailer, which is called Safeway Jordan, who runs the two supermarkets. 
Any third party has to access iCloud's interface at one point in order to make a transaction. They say it is encrypted, but obviously, any encryption has vulnerable spots. Supporters say it gives the refugees their dignity back because they can choose what they want to buy. Although there is obviously truth in this claim, the idea to disperse cash or credit cards through iris scanning or iris scanners where possible, turns the digitized people as refugees into consumers of refugee aid, with the constant danger of misuse and leaks. So in what setting does UNHCR operate? Nation states are the only actors that can grant asylum. Most of the states do so on the basis of the 1951 Refugee Convention, that defines who's a refugee and what rights and obligations they have. Depending on the circumstances in each country where it operates, the UNHCR takes on quasi-state roles in order to protect and assist refugees as Privacy International writes. And I quote, UNHCR operates in more than 100 countries around the world in many different jurisdictions, with many different authorities, host societies, local communities, widely differing and often very difficult environments. Many refugee hosting countries have neither privacy or data protection laws nor authorities that would enforce them. And while UNHCR can determine in guidelines how it deals with personal data and benefits from privileges and immunities as any other UN institution, Refugees have the duty to conform to the laws and regulations of their host country. And, importantly, many of these host countries are developing their own surveillance systems. Often funded by Western governments and development foundations, um, governments across, across Asia, Africa and Latin America are developing population registers, biometric registers, electronic medical registries, amongst others, and the governments are, very, are becoming very keen to bring UNHCR data into their own systems. So digital IDs enabled by biometrics would save the nation state billions of dollars in subsidies. It's an often used argument by one of the said so-called development foundations, such as the World Bank Group. Here's a quote from a 2006 report from UNHCR Malaysia. And I quote, Nang Piang, a refugee from Myanmar, placed his finger tentatively on the biometric scanner, that is, a fingerprint scanner. I don't know what it is for, but I do what UNHCR wants me to do, he said. From the same report, this is an important step for UNHCR Malaysia as we strengthen the security of our registration system to prevent fraud said Volker Türk, head of UNHCR in Malaysia. And again, such a security measure will certainly enhance the credibility of UNHCR's registration systems in the eyes of the Malaysian government. I think this statement illustri illustrates above-mentioned links of biometrics with the interests of national governments. Fair enough, the justifications for biometrics also refer to faster and more precise registration and better refugee assistance. But another reason, as the quote indicates, is also to prevent fraud in the form of double registrations and thus the reception of double aid. In my opinion, legitimizing the introduction of biometrics with fraud prevention stands for a shift in the image of refugees. People who flee are now under blanket suspicion of being con artists and not first and foremost people who seek protection and shelter. This ambition, th sorry, <laughs> this suspicion is embedded in the current political climate and xenophobic developments that refers to pejorative uses of the slogan economic migrant. All refugees that take the risky journey to Europe are economic migrants, suggesting that, quote, People are trying to play or cheat the systems, that their very presence is the cause of problems at the border, 
and that if we could only filter them out, order would be restored. End of quote from a Guardian article by Daniel Trilling. The UNHCR's 2018 estimate is that around 68 million people were forced to flee their homes. More refugees and eternally displaced persons than ever before, but 86% of these remain in the so-called developing world, not in wealthy regions such as Europe. Millions now live in refugee camps. Many have been there for decades. As camps become encamped cities, they create new forms of urban governance. I want to give you another context of the term humanitarian intervention and the connotation of the camp with Michel Agis. He has been thoroughly researching the lives in refugee camps in the Middle East and North Africa, and he writes, humanitarian intervention borders with policing. There is no care without control. With this quote, I do not intend to polemically question the role of the UN Refugee Agency in general. It is very clear that their support is of crucial importance. However, what I want to draw your attention to is that there is this ambivalence between care and control embedded in the term humanitarian intervention itself. This enables a special mode of social organizations that runs with and through humanitarian governance. In the last decades, this form of governance has become more occupied with migration control and management than with protection, Michel Agis argues. In the camps, given the control systems already in place, Biometrics are a further tool that renders new forms of intervention and governance possible. As sociologist Katja linskov jakobsen says, I think this is a critical, a very important point. The new form of intervention over lives, that is, control through information, does never render the older forms, older power relations of intervention obsolete. Rather, it is adding up, I think. There's this enormous power imbalance when you consider that the UNHCR has the biometric data of millions of people at its disposal, and they continue to scan. The context of insecurity, sorry, states of emergency and urgency makes all actions taken by the UNHCR by definition an undertaking under unsafe circumstances. That's precisely why the use of experimental technologies like biometrics in this insecure context is very, very problematic, as I think. Technological experiments are performed and legitimated with reference to this emergency, necessitating that something must be done and it must be done urgently. It is in this setting that the camps are serving as laboratories <laughs> for testing new and unsafe technologies. Vulnerable people who fled have become live test subjects, and no one really has a choice to opt out. As the digitized refugee body opens up new possibilities of intervention, new data sharing practices and policies emerge as a crucial issue, according to Katja Linskov Jakobsen. But it took until 2015 that the UN Refugee Agency published its first data policy for refugees. The policy sounds good because it states that agreements to process biometric data and other data must be given informed and freely. But the, cons the, the compulsory connection of biometric data with the acknowledgement as refugee contradicts this, I think. As you cannot, as you cannot opt out, is this a free decision? A 2006 UNHCR internal audit found that in four out of five reviewed country operations, the information being given to refugees about the biometric program was insufficient for them to be properly informed. By the way, in said audit, they didn't bother to interview actual registered people, but just the UNHCR stuff on the ground. Furthermore, the policy is notably vague on which implementing parties and third parties may access data and does not address what restrictions apply to third-party data access. 
And given the many third parties, private companies, donors, banks, host states, and even the states that people just have fled from, misuse is always possible. Under these conditions, it is very problematic that no alternative to scanning is offered. These databases can have life-threatening consequences if they fall into the wrong hands. Under these conditions, it is very... Okay, that <laughs> I already had. UNHCR is well aware of this, but it remains to be a huge dilemma. Privacy International writes, and I quote, pro-Assad groups such as the Syrian Electronic Army have successfully hacked into well-defended systems in the past. Imagine if they wanted to gain access to these databases. As refugees are slowly becoming consumers, the boundaries between humanitarian aid and commercial interests are blurring. Humanitarian aid more and more becomes a business with constant monitoring and ev evaluation sheets, assessment protocols, data collection and checklists. Here's an example to give you an idea. In 2016, the UN World Humanitarian Summit took place in Istanbul for the very first time. During the summit, a huge exhibition fair took place with over 600 companies from the whole world presenting their humanitarian products. Among them, vendors of drones next to a MasterCard representative and big accountant companies such as Accenture. Even workers of the travel portal TripAdvisor attended a panel on flight routes. In and as well outside the camp, the growing interest of the private sector and tech company in the so-called developing markets reframes the world's poor people as entities of untapped markets. The logistics of connecting them to global capital, giving them an ID number and a biometric barcode is a novel way of generating profit. It is also the entrance gate into online and offline labor markets, which is not per se a bad thing. Many people who fled want to work to be more independent, obviously. But considering the neoliberal climate in which UNHCR acts, it is important that the people don't become objectified as cheap labor and as mere resources. That would be nothing more than a continu con continuation of the Western prosperity model, which has, since colonialism, as we know, been based on the global south as the cheap raw material supplier and outlet for products. In an increasingly neoliberal climate that seeks to minimize costs, rationalize its procedures, and maximize profits, new technologies such as biometrics, 3D printing, drones, and robots are introduced in order to innovate, but also to save money for the always underfunded aid agencies. It is doubtful if that's really the case, as software needs to be updated and maintained constantly. The appraisal of this technology of innovation and of big data as the new gold or the new oil of the 21st century, the compulsory datafication and the linking of identities with online databases is putting people at risk. How can you and HCR and its cooperation partners make sure that people won't be ex exploited, their privacy will be guaranteed, and that digital systems are not surveillance systems? Thank you. Thank you, Ariane. Don't go away. Don't go away. I've got a couple of questions for you, and after that, you have to answer the audience. So you should stay here. And in fact, we'll bring uh, Regina and Dr. Hafen, Hafen as well. My, uh, the point I'd like to hear you expand on is the question of the ambivalence of care and control, which you expressed very clearly. But I'd like to hear more because I want to relate it to the ambivalence of security and control. And I'd like to hear what is your, this is my first question, what is your opinion about that second ambivalence, which seems to justify a whole lot of other things besides exactly. taking over our identities? Well, I mean, can you turn, yeah, it's, it's very uh, good uh, and tricky and complex question. Um, what is my take on that? I mean, of course, we have to have some sort of governance. We have to have some sort of uh, structure that is applied in the camp, which is obviously a true, but it's all coming from the outside. So, so there's not so much that the uh, people in the camp can actually really do to really organize themselves. I mean, of course, they are here now, there are initiatives, there's also NGOs supporting them in doing that and, and, and empowering them. But in general, the overall um, yeah, 
problem or situation um, is that it's coming from outside. So they are en encamped and they have a very clear uh, structure. Yeah. In order to, and they, they're not in allowed. Order, in order to live there. They are not allowed in a camp without accepting this condition. Uh, well, I mean, yeah, in a way, but it's not, you know, like they don't sign a contract. However, okay. they sign this uh, sheet that they uh, agreed for the biometric registration. Okay. Um, but, yeah, it's just a living realities. And, I mean, we heard yesterday, I don't, I don't know who was there, but Kilian Kleinschmidt, he was the former manager of uh, Zatri Camp, and he... Um, told us about how it is. I mean, it's very chaotic. There are so many people, very vulnerable people, different people coming there in this camp, living together. So, so it's not, so it's very difficult indeed on the ground. So, so, so the idea with this ambivalence is not to be like a very, like on the meta level and say, yeah, you're so bad or something. I mean, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. But the way these things get entangled more and more and they, um, and the uh, UNHCR is more connected or interested with uh, migration control and management rather than protection. Mm -hmm. This is like a shift which is problematic. Well, my uh, second question is actually subsidiary and allows me to bring back here yes. uh, Dr. Dr. Hafen and uh, Re Regina Rini as well. My second question is, uh, how do you think that the wonderful presentation of Dr. Hafen correlates with the question that you have raised. And then you can probably talk to each other about yeah, this. Yeah, we already started uh, <laughs> pre-discussing. <laughs> do you want to start or? I, I think you, you asked No, I, I, I mean, I, I, I absolutely see what, what, your, what your issues are and what the dangers are. But you can turn refugees also the other way around. You can give them control over their data. Yes. And that is something that is, again, much more powerful than because any of these agencies will have a subset of that data. And if you empower them to get this data at, this, uh, at the time when they're refugees and they decide what they want to do with it, they can already you know, decide what to do. So I think that's a great empowerment. You don't have to only see data as a tool for surveillance. It is, no, it's, uh, it's the uh, ambivalence uh, between care and control, I guess. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, it does work. All right, so um, now uh, the question is up to the audience. I've been asked to give you 10 minutes to ask questions, and we have really brilliant speakers, and it's an occasion to really learn. I certainly have learned a lot, and I'm very happy, and there is one question. Uh, just a short comment to Mr. Hafen. Uh, I like your project. Uh, but I, I don't trust any cloud, and, and I don't think it's necessary to have any cloud. So we have uh, decentralized structures now, so I think it's a design error to use the same uh, centralized uh, design. <laughs> okay, fine. I, see, this is, I'm not a computer scientist, right? So I have to trust my co-founders of the cooperative. One is, used to be uh, the head of um, databases and, and cloud computing at ETH uh, Zurich, so he knows a little bit about these things. But that's why I think you cannot make this top down. You know, it's like the electronic patient records, for example. If you want to implement that top down and say everyone has to do it, then it won't work. You have to do it bottom up. And if you don't trust the cloud, if you don't trust the, 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 the platform, you can take your data out or you cannot even start to open an account. That is what has to be guaranteed. And that is guaranteed. Think about the smartphone. 12 years ago, there was no law to introduce smartphones worldwide. Everyone and his brother has one of those now. Without, but it's, your, it's optional. So that's why I think these, these bottom-up uh, 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 initiatives have to come. You sign in. Not everyone had a bank account at the first time when the first banks opened. It's the same thing. It's up to you to decide whether you want to join or not. Well, thank you. Um, questions? Are you stunned? 
<laughs> I am. There's one. <laughs> First, Ariana, thank you for your presentation. Um, my question is uh, related to the use of this data for people to find each other, um, maybe family members who are in a different camp or in a different country. Um, I visited the uh, Red Crescent Museum in Geneva a few months ago and saw that amazing room of all the old handwritten cards from you know, World War I and World War II. So I'm just wondering how you reconcile those kinds of uses you know, with these questions of privacy and control um, if you have opinions about that. Yeah, hello, yes. Um, previously to our research in Jordan, we were in northern Iraq, KRG, to um, make a report about like online outsourcing industries and there was a little programming school that is like very fastly educating uh, refugees to become uh, software developers and in that broader research we also, with Christina Zonedin, my colleague, we found, of course, there are many NGOs um, that work on that topic of bringing the families together. And, of course, they use more like the metadata or the geo, um, geolocational data of the smartphones. And sometimes they do like kind of like forensic research to trying to stitch together where could they have been last seen and how, how could that come together. I think, and again, I'm referring to this, to this sort of ambivalence, yeah, I mean, you, you cannot outweigh one against the other. I think it's very, data can be always used for good, but given the, I try to lay out this very complex structure between host states, the UNHCR um, and donors, the tech companies, so there's so many players with different interests, and the UNHCR has a very sensitive task to kind of also deal with it because they are under the jurisdiction of the nation states. So given all these things, I think it's just very important to strengthen the de debate about it and to also empower like, local communities to really like, put the technology back into their hands. So I totally agree with you. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. We're going to wrap up very quickly, but since nobody has a question for uh uh, Regina, I have one. Oh, you do? Okay, then I will, I'll, I'll ask my question later to you. <laughs> Go, yeah, we have somebody there. Yeah, so this is maybe something for, for Mr. Harmon and maybe also Adriana. So, um, at the moment, nobody is forced to put his uh, or her, her data into some databases. Um, so this is uh, at least uh, what companies tell you. So, for example, Mark Zuckerberg will, will always tell you, oh, yeah, you, you may be a part of my platform, or you, you may not. And, um, um, but in, in fact, we know that uh, you will be socially isolated if you don't uh, join these platforms. Or we all know that our, um, our smartphones are being uh, crawled out of, uh, for, for um, telephone numbers even. So, so I don't have a Facebook app installed, but I know every friend of mine who has uh, the Facebook app installed is giving my telephone number to Facebook. So um, what, what, you're, what you're basically telling uh, Mr. Harvin is that we all have to be scanned for our private data the same way. So. Um, you could also say we have to be, we have total surveillance in order to be all equally um, paying into this platform. So this is one, I think, very dystopian way of approaching this problem. Um, so this is one, one way to, to feed this. And the other thing is, okay, if you, if you give the power of which data you share um, to the people, you will... I think you will every time run into this problem of uh, monetizing the data back. So there will always be people who want to make money out of your data. And if you are sharing this over your platform, it is just shifting the problem to another point, in my opinion. Or, or am I missing something? Well, I think on our platform, you can read the articles of association, they're on the website, you can read them. There is no way you can monetize the data without the consent of the ethics committee. 
That is what the ethics committee is doing for. And there is no way you can get paid for sharing your data. An app that would allow that would not run on our platform. Now, there are plenty of other platforms where you can do precisely that. So there is room for that, but we want the people that do it not for the, the micropayment, because it's really, the value is in the aggregated data, and that is the idea that that should go back. And it is absolutely each individual's decision whether he wants to join, open an account, and how much data he wants to share. It's not, we are not forcing anyone to, to share that. That would be totally wrong. Because some people, I would be much more open. That's why I went to 23andMe and did my genome there. I knew and I signed the, the, the general terms that they would use this for research. I said, yes, I make a, a contribution to research. I, would do that. I uploaded my genome profile on Snipedia, which is an open platform, open snip it's called, where you can download my data also. I have no problems with that, but that's, that's my own problem, and, and others may feel different. Another question from there? Yeah, there's one in the back. Or, you know, so disinformation has been always part of the political process. And then when it came to the Iranian uh, revolution, you know, it was Facebook. But then they've had one before, and then that was the fax machine that spurred it. So it's always been used rather than saying people have done it. They say that technology has done it. Uh, what do you think about that? I think that's a really good point. So those of you who couldn't hear the beginning, the question was, is technology getting too much credit? Or some of the things I was talking about, other people worry about, these are things that have always been with us in one form or another. And I think that's a really good point to keep in mind. Another way to see that I think you were alluding to is after the revolutions around 2009, 2010, 2011, especially in the Middle East, people started giving a lot of credit to Twitter. And very quickly, as many of those revolutions did not go super well, then suddenly people started saying, oh no, it wasn't Twitter after all. People want to, want to jump in and give credit or blame in the case of interference in the US election in 2016, and we just don't know. We actually just don't know how much of what's happening would have happened anyway without the technology and how much technology is changing things. What I think is true no matter what is that exactly how things play out is definitely changed by the technology. How we interact mm -hmm. with one another is affected by the medium we use to interact with one another. So it might be that the end result of an election or a revolution might have turned out the same way without the technology, but how we got there and how we can predict future events like like that really makes a big difference to understanding the details. Well, picking, up, <clears throat> picking up on that, um, again to you, my question was, in Canada, you're not, you haven't been there long enough to know this, but in Canada we like to call royal commissions to examine such matters. The Queen of England has nothing to do with it, but it's still called royal commission. What do you think should the political system do to actually start really getting into this? Because your answer to the gentleman is, is, is correct. There is a very strong part played by technology. Behind it, there are a bunch of people who are making the big bucks by clicktivism. So what's your opinion about that? It's a really good question, and it's really hard to know. So this is actually an active debate in Canada right now. The government and political parties are worried about Canada has a general election next year, mm -hmm. and having watched what happened next door in the United States. But there's no agreement on how to handle it right now. So different policies are being tried, but it's all very, very complicated. I think the big worry is that if any government agency started having a power to do something about this, they might abuse that power to benefit themselves and the media. And so that's, that's the big worry. I, I wish that there were a clear answer, but unfortunately it seems very much uh, for debate right now. All right, thank you. Is there one more question? That's the, all the time we've got left. Yes, there's one. Oh, you're. Um, Midata, uh, do you know Hoda, a new company in Italy which does the same things you, you told? Do you have heard about Hoda? Hoda. No. cooperative movement in, in Italy also, but no, I'd like to hear more about it. Okay, thank you. 
Great. Can, well, I actually can, think this... Can I oh, have yeah. one last question okay. uh, to you, Regina, about you saying that, that one should identify the bots? I think that's a very good thing. But how about, you know, identifying the people that you actually give your real identity on Twitter, for example, and that you get a different status? So to, to say to the people, come out, how this identity is then really done is another question, but, but I'm really, you know, me, and I'm, that's my opinion, rather than goofy at gmail.com or something like that, right? <laughs> so I, so the um, social media platforms already do something like this. Facebook and Twitter have a verified account policy where if you can prove to them you are who you say you are, they give you a special little check mark or a little symbol. The worry about this is it reduces their ability, their usefulness for things like, um, uh, revolutions or for people who are trying to r push against oppressive regimes. So in many governmental systems, especially non-democracies, that's actually a problem. People don't want to reveal their real identity. So we need some sort of a system that allows for anonymous activism without also turning anonymous trolls into the people who have all the power. And it's a real, real hard, difficult balance. Yeah, I think we better uh, stop. I just want to t thank the three of you, Regina Arini and Ariana Dongus, and Ernst Hafen for a session packed with information and revelation. So thank you very much and a big hand for our three speakers.
Okay. Yeah, but that's okay. It's it's broth. It's broth. No, that should be fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. This is C uh, viola somewhere. Or? Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. Because the problem is I don't know who the speakers are, all the speakers from states. So, okay. <laughs> Marco, could I? Yeah. I met her, yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, was in Houston. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, that's good to know. Thank you. No, 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 don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, it has to go both paths, right? Hello, Marco, could I? I, I expect I'm listening Deutsch, but most of it, yeah, 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 yeah. She will be the first speaker, so that's why I want to make sure that I'm not really an organizer, I'm just moderating, so I'm not I don't have control over what uh, how the start is happening, right? But we'll see. Marco Pugai. Uh, hi. Um, we might have met once or so, but uh, in any case, I'm chairing the session or moderating at least. If you prefer to have a different role than speaker, if you rather want to ask some questions or let me know, uh, I'm flexible. Uh, okay. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we need a, a microphone for yeah, probably yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I hope Carla will just.
really yeah. fun to use. Yeah, they've got stands for anything. They're doing what they can, I think. Let's get to the next speaker, right? Or, or do you maybe, maybe if I can focus a bit more on the content, if one of you could hand the microphone or something, that would be that to the next speaker always. So I will call the next speaker. Yeah. Okay. But the other speakers need a microphone. So, or or it can be just left there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, that's that's what I want yeah. to know. Yeah. It might be good to have if you have a spare room to just have it there so people can take it or something. Um, okay, but that's good. That's good. So just. The floor is open. It's fine. Anytime. Anytime. Okay. Uh, you give the call. Yeah. I'll check in as soon as you give the call. Okay. Then in one minute or so, I will <laughs> say hello to everybody. <laughs> Just to say hello, uh, Marco Tuber. Ah, I yeah, think I we'll hold on. I've <laughs> seen you before in Brussels once in a McLuhan conference. <laughs> yes. It's a while. Yoni van den Ede. Yes. It's a while ago. We talked briefly, but yeah, it's a while ago. And now they asked me here in Ars Electronica to moderate, uh, which is like to make sure that my stress levels keep. Uh <laughs> No, it's good. It's good. Um, so I'll I'll be starting soon. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, we start the next session. Our next session is on AI in arts and science. And I want to a long introduction because we have many speakers, but let me just say that there is already for a while, both at Ars Electronica and in wider society, these discussions um, on the one hand about art and science, how to combine art and science, what can art contribute to science and innovation, and on the other hand, we have also a tradition in Europe about responsible innovation um, and, and discussions in academia, for example, about this. Now, in this session, we ask the question, what happens now when AI enters the stage? What should we do um, with regard to responsible innovation in AI? And what does this mean for art-science collaboration? How can art contribute to responsible innovation in AI? Um, how can, can there be an ethical awareness among researchers, among people in industry, um, for these issues. And in this session, we have a number of distinguished speakers that make contributions about thinking about AI um, and also thinking about, like, yeah, how can we uh, bring together art and science? So I propose that we start. And our first speaker is uh, Mr. Roberto Viola from uh, European Commission. He's Director General of DG Connect, which is Director General of Communication Networks, Content and Technology at the European Commission, and um, yeah, he, uh, it's, it's great to have him here because in the, the European Union has, uh, in its research funding programs, um, has, has always been very supportive of responsible innovation, uh, but not only that, also with the STARTS program, has been um, doing a program which, which actually supports combining art and science. So, pleasure to have you here, and I give the floor to you. Thanks very much. I understand this does not rotate. I have uh, to rotate myself. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be in Linz, and I, I really love uh, the art of the imperfection. I was thinking of my university time when I was doing something sloppy, uh, getting back marks. I, I, maybe I could have said that this is the art of the imperfection, you know. It's <laughs> So, but the art of the imperfection is about uh, people. So my name, uh, as you heard, is Roberto Viola. I am uh, the head of uh, the, 
department in the European Commission that deals with digital technology, policy. I'm the department that gave you free roaming around, so you should be happy about this. But we don't just... <laughs> or things like net neutrality. Now we are a rare species as Europeans to have a law about net neutrality. Um, but also we do uh, a lot of technology. We invest uh, uh, every year two billions of European taxpayer money in advanced technology and in particular in artificial intelligence, which of course we all believe is going to be the next big thing. Uh, or is it an hype? Uh, is it true? We do believe uh, it is true. Now, so you have this kind of triangle, uh, the people, uh, the technology, and the art. Uh, is it something that you can separate? I don't think so. I mean, uh, they are, of course, one of the same thing. Uh, and this has always been like this in the history of mankind. Uh, I had hoped that you invited me as a pianist, but unfortunately, you invited me as a bureaucrat. But, uh, as a pianist, I can tell you that the history of music is an history about technology. Uh, and the way of composing music, piano music, changed completely when uh, the pianoforte was invented and uh, started to spread around Europe. You could uh, play piano and forte, which means the color of the music, the sound of the music uh, uh, would really sound different. The experience would be different. And that was the moment where you could see the shift from classical music to romantic music to very complex harmonies, very structured harmonies. So, I mean, music really followed technology. And over and over, this is true also in paintings, in sculpture, in, uh, in every form of main kind uh, uh, way of expressing. And I'm sure that today Mozart would use AI. By the way, uh, I mean, uh, I have listened to outputs of uh, Bach uh, type composition uh, done with AI. I think it's, uh, it's an interesting result. The purist would say, no, over my dead body. I'm very intrigued. I'm very intrigued by this. I think we should not uh, think that uh, art is something static that stays in a museum. Art is something that lives with us and stays with us and moves with us. So I think artists should embrace AI. So you have seen Christie's now auctioning the first AI painting. I don't comment about the painting, but I mean, it's, it's interesting that it starts. Or uh, composers that, I mean, are trying to mix uh, what is art of composition by mankind and AI. And so we are very excited, very busy, but of course we look at AI also with uh, eyes, uh, well, I wouldn't say critical eyes, but I mean, we ask ourselves questions. The question we ask ourselves is how we have a society, a sustainable introduction in society of AI. How we avoid the minority report type of society, you know, this society that decides by algorithm that you are a criminal and puts you in prison even if you've done nothing. Now, is my science to you just a science fiction novel, but I mean, what we see emerging, for instance, in China, lets us think about algorithms that are screening the possibility to have a loan and uh, decide whether, I mean, your kids can go to school or not. I mean, uh, we as Europeans, we might be at times slow in embracing technology, uh, but I think we have uh, uh, a reflex, which it is to defend what we call the fundamental values of our societies, which is the right to be an individual, the right to have a future, the right to be together. And it's for this reason that we have put together a group of the best experts in Europe and in the world uh, to think about the ethical sustainability of AI and come up, we hope, with the charter of key principles that will be consulted all over Europe. And once, I mean, we have the feedback of everyone, including the companies, we have created an AI alliance of, today we have 2,500 companies, again, not just European companies, and we do hope that this charter will be adopted 
by everyone. So before we even think about legislation, before we even think of imposing something, we think the society has to have the reflex to adopt a responsible way of using AI. AI can do fantastic things. AI can improve medicine. I mean, I've seen uh, things uh, which are really, really promising for all of us, this concept of uh, personalized medicine, making possible uh, to doctors to be much more precise in diagnosis, can do better uh, things than I am able to do with my little finance, I mean, with the, uh, intelligent advice. All of this is very nice, but at the same time, we need responsible AI. And coming to art, so it's now a few years that we do this uh, kind of marriage between art and technology, this STARS prize. And tonight we will announce the winners. And so the idea is that, there's, as I said, no contradiction between arts and technology. On the contrary, technology can help art, and art can uh, help technology to be better. And this is for sure the case also for AI. And I'm sure next year or in two years from now, we will give prizes to AI-based forms of art. But at the same time, I don't think we should uh, stop having pupils uh, uh, learning piano or learning how to draw. This would be a drama for our society. Uh, I don't think that we dream a society of people watching robots painting and composing music. I don't think this is our collective dream. So the challenge is how to make sure that the new generations have the right skills to use all of this and at the same time maintain, I mean, uh, uh, let me call it the human dimension, which is very necessary because, of course, a society without art is a society without future. And uh, uh, people without being able to do something are people without future. So our future is definitely better with technology, but also we need to own our future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, we'll, we'll come back later to, to thinking about um, the ethical aspects of um, AI. The, I first want to uh, introduce the next speaker, who is a research associate at the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion and soon research fellow in artificial intelligence at Homerton College, Cambridge, and who draws on anthropological fieldwork about narratives in order to explore the public understanding of AI. Right? Because we have all this discussion, discourse in uh, society about AI now. Um, so let me uh, give the word to Beth Singler. Uh, I will try very hard not to turn my back on you. I feel incredibly rude if I do, but I also don't know if I can pivot the whole, whole way through, but we'll see how we go. Uh, yes, I'm an anthropologist, and I pay particular attention to AI narratives, the kind of shaping stories that we tell, both about artificial intelligence, but also about ourselves, and those two things in combination. And I, I've been doing some work and thinking about this question in particular. It's not moving on. Move on, move on. Do I need to press the click? Technology is wonderful. It never works when I touch it. No? Do I click here? Do I click here? Does anyone know? It did work a moment ago. I have a Mercury in retrograde somewhere. No? <laughs> you may only get one picture for my entire talk. Doesn't want to move. I've broken it instantly. This is a great start. No, is this just that one, isn't it? There, there we go. Now it wants to work. Okay. I have this problem almost every time I give a talk. There is something about me that technology does not like. Uh, that is also a narrative, by the way. How does the technology we develop reflect perfectly or imperfectly how we understand what it is to be human? You can also flip this question the other way around and think about how does technology affect our understanding of the human? The second question, there's lots of historical precedents for. I have some examples here. 
Astrology, treated completely as a contemporary science and technology at the time, gave people a biological connection to the stars. Galvanism, later on, gave us the idea of resurrecting the dead through electricity. And the telegraph gave us the model of communication at long distance that the spiritualists adopted when they started holding seances. But going back to that first question, how does technology we develop reflect perfectly or imperfectly how we understand what it is to be human? With the development of artificial intelligence, we are working from a base conception of what intelligence is. The scientists who first came up with the term had a very particular understanding of that, and I've got a quote here from Robert Walensky, who was quite a foundational figure in that field, who says that the, uh, they were mathematicians by training, and mathematicians do two things. They prove theorems and play chess, and they said, hey, if it proves a theorem or plays chess, it must be smart. It's a very functional attitude towards intelligence and what it can do and how it can be successful at doing those things. Well, that's a capacity of the human that they saw as enhanceable or replicable and placeable in something else, artificial intelligence. But intelligence has changing definitions and attributes in different cultural contexts and historical periods. So therefore, is the, is the context of intelligence being ignored there, the social and shared elements that are so important to how we use human intelligence? And I came up with a rather silly, flippant maybe, thought experiment that I, I published a little while ago called the Elf Ranger Test. Uh, where I suggested that actually, if we're going to use games to train AI, perhaps we should be thinking about social intelligence games, sociable storytelling collaborative games like tabletop role playing. And I put my hands up, I'm a bit of a geek, I love Dungeons and Dragons. And this was my starting idea. You know, if we could create AI that could play and pass as a Dungeons and Dragons player, where success isn't necessarily about optimizing for the best results in terms of scores, but actually enjoying the experience, perhaps we'd get closer to something like an equivalent to our intelligence. Now, some people have come back and said, well, if you could do that, you've basically solved artificial general intelligence, so maybe this is a way off. But the, the idea of a test in artificial general intelligence as being provable by a test has captured people's imaginations. And as I say, I'm very interested in the stories we tell about artificial intelligence. So how about this one? I'm not scared of a computer passing the Turing test. I'm terrified of one that intentionally fails it. There's a nice combination there, not only of the, the historical Turing test, but this fear of what artificial intelligence can be and do. And I don't actually, for once, have a picture of a Terminator in my presentation. But almost every time there is a press story, and there's been another one recently, um, about artificial intelligence and what the future might bring, the Terminator pops up. We have these dystopic fear-laden AI narratives, and they're very impactful. Where does this come from? Well, one suggestion might be uh, Masahiro Mori's work on the Uncanny Valley, if you're familiar with this, that there is a stage at which human likeness becomes close enough, but not quite close enough, and actually causes a feeling of disturbance. It affects us emotionally, we feel fear. Um, this is not purely physical, but obviously examples with the sort of form of physicality are useful. So some of you will find these more disturbing than others. Some of you may actually work in CGI digital humanity fields and actually find these quite standard and not too scary at all. But some people find the nearness to humanity but not complete humanity a little bit scary. And I think this, this sense of the uncanny comes from objects and concepts and potential beings that transverse categories, that unstabilize categories that we thought were once stable. And I, I draw a parallel to liminal creatures things that are both human and non-human, or wise and bestial, or um, dead and alive, there's a ghost there as well. Things that don't sit into settled categories. And I think AI can be one of these things too. Murray Shanahan's talked about something called conscious exotica. He's a technologist, he actually works to create artificial intelligence. And he locates this potential space where human likeness is relatively low, but consciousness is quite high. So something that has something like artificial general intelligence or what we would term consciousness or pure consciousness, but doesn't seem very much like us. And that might be a scary space. Now, we already have existing cosmologies of other than human persons. There's rivers that are treated with personhood. There's uh, objects in Shinto and Buddhism and other religious and cultural contexts. So why is this seemingly uncanny feeling arising because of artificial intelligence? Well, I like to draw on the work of Mary Douglas, who came up with this concept of dirt being matter out of place in her book, Purity and Danger, 
where things that do not fall neatly into categories need to be dealt with, we have to come up with stories and explanations of what they are and what we must do with them. And likewise, Julia Kristeva's work on the abject, what disturbs identity, system and order, what does not respect borders, positions and rules. AI, I feel, has a potential to be mind out of place. Our perception of AI as a mind, accurately or inaccurately, again, we're talking about narratives and stories, can lead to fear-based reactions, which can either enhance or detract from our advances in technology. Uh, Jim Al-Khalali, the new um, head of the British Science Association, has just been reported in a big speech as he's starting off his new role, saying that the biggest problem for the development of artificial intelligence technology is people's fear of what it could become. So this idea of mind out of place, I think, is a way of exploring where that fear comes from. It's the disturbing effect of seeing an aspect of ourselves elsewhere than expected or reflected back to us inaccurately. And I think AI represents a very contemporary example of that. Another example, which I think is quite powerful, is perhaps the first modern example, would be Frankenstein or Frankenstein's monster. Someone's going to call me up on that if I say Frankenstein. That the monster represents, again, something that does not sit uh, firmly in categories, it's both dead and alive, it's both born and made, it sort of takes apart our assumptions about what the human being is. So it's not surprising perhaps, and these are examples that I haven't created, these are artworks by other people, the synergy between Frankenstein and artificial intelligence. This year is the anniversary of Mary Shelley's novel. Uh, I've already given about three talks on AI and Frankenstein. People are seeing the parallels and the similarities, not just in assumptions about mad scientists going to ruin the world with a technology that they don't understand, but questions about personhood and createdness and being born and made. So in summary, uh, where the reflection fails, where we have aspirations for what artificial intelligence could be, and where we have assumptions about what the human is, and they aren't worked out completely in artificial intelligence, I think that's an interesting space for exploring anthropologically and narratively where we understand ourselves. We can look back on ourselves and reflect on what we think it means to be human. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Matt Singler. The next speaker is Derek de Kerkhove, former director of the McLuhan program at the University of Toronto. In Europe, he is now in Rome and scientific director of Media Duemila and Osservatorio Tutti Media. I give the word to you. Thank you. I need to have a microphone. <laughs> No, it's no, it's in there. It's already there. Yeah. Did you see it? Uh, it was another computer, I guess. Oh. Well, I can give you the. <laughs> I've got it on the line, but I'm sorry about that. I came <laughs> two hours ago to put it in. Uh, okay, un po' classico. Ecco qua. There we are. So it's called um, algorithmetics. It's a word I created on the spot when I was asked to give a title. Yeah, and um, it's, uh, it's written specially. It's written with ethics with H at the end. There we are. Good. So it's all about that, exactly, uh, about the ethics of algorithms and I hope this works. What do I do with that? Oh, well, <clears throat> there we go. All right, so what would that, what would that imply? Uh, there are three ways of understanding the relationship between algorithms and ethics. One of them is the ethics of using algorithms, which is discussed quite a bit around the issue, for example, of how much algorithms are actually helping out of their jobs a lot of people. That's one of the aspects of using algorithms in society. They actually replace manpower. The second one is ethics of behavior as effects 
of algorithms, which is the way we are ourselves totally dependent or getting to be very dependent on, on algorithmic calculation. And then the one which is the most interesting is ethics embedded in the algorithm, which is another uh, very strong drive into artificial intelligence. We're going through an epistemological mutation. I suppose all of us have had that intuition one way or the other. But the, one of the definitions that is going on now is that we're moving from the logical, which is the consequential series of arguments that go into a conclusion or a decision, into the ecological, which, by which I don't mean the environment, by which I mean many, 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 many uh, parameters driven by big data that bring you to make your decision. A third thing that's happening is, of course, the fake news. A fake news is part of this transition. And why is it part of this transition? Because what we are witnessing in fake news is the disappearance of the need for the referent. In the triad of the sign that was created by, uh, was created by uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, you have the relationship between the signifier, anything that you see that may have a meaning, and then the signified, which is what that sign is actually referring to as a concept. But in fact, what that concept itself refers to is something in reality. It may be an object or it can be an, an, another idea, but it exists outside of the frame of reference uh, immediately uh, contained into the sign. What the disappearance of the reference makes is that people don't care, and in fact, there, was, there has been in the description of this session, uh, that people have lost real interest in the veracity of statements. Well, yes, there is a kind of a conflation of the objective and the subjective when you start voting for people on the basis not of what you think should be the best government, but how you feel the person should be. That's, I'm not going to go any further into that, but what is leading us to is a, is a strange kind of datacracy. And this is how the Big data and, uh, is becoming the cognitive content of the whole of humanity on Earth. And what you are seeing here are all the progress from now, from uh, the 70s to, to now, of the various intelligent, artificial intelligent techniques that are not necessarily all related directly to the production of artificial intelligence, but that show and move extraordinarily rapidly towards a very strong development of artificial intelligence. And one of its consequences, which is up there, uh, is the anticipatory uh, analytics. What is happening now is that we are moving our, the vector of time that we carry within us in our psychological an emotional experience is moving from past-oriented or present experience to future expected. So we began with a low complexity reporting on what happened, then we became more clever and started analyzing, then we uh, monitored what was going on, predicting, and then of course simulating now what will happen. So this is a very different way of looking at time and experiencing time. A very good book just came out, and I translated it because I thought it was so good, Il Mondo Dato by Cosimo Akoto, and he says predictive analysis is the condition that emerges from the intersection of data and algorithms is the anticipation, the ability of the new sensorial and cognitive apparatus to anticipate with a feed-forward mechanism events and behaviors. The prolapses, the orientation towards the future requires amplification, automation, and constant updating, even if invisible to the human, as they are produced by autonomous and automated technologies. And what happens now is what we call ambient uh, artificial intelligence, which is taken over by Google and by several other companies that they're actually combining together to create this ambient artificial intelligence, which is another thing from what we also call the artificial general intelligence, which we haven't achieved yet, but which is supposed to make artificial intelligence emulate very, very clearly the human intelligence. What would the algorithmic bias be there? As machines are able to harvest more data from their environment and to process those data, creating a model of the environment and perceiving their role interaction with the environment, they are shifting from being passive to becoming active towards an understanding of the environment. That's a statement that I contributed to because I am part of a research group on the uh, symbiotic autonomous systems, and we're pushing out a white paper now on exactly what, how we relate to these machines which are doing stuff for us that, <laughs> you know, we're not getting to take for granted. The, uh, 
Commissioner Viola made a mention of China, uh, this is what I call datacracy. When, depending on data that is picked up from the use of your cell phone or from whatever kind of information previously in a database concerning you, in a previous session we were talking about reclaiming control of our data, that's not going to happen in China. Because what happens is that they actually have all the stuff you see above there, the, uh, all, the, all the part which is on top, as data which allows or doesn't allow all the benefits that come in under it. And what uh, Commissioner Viola said uh, was, was correct. It's a very, it's a very uh, dangerous kind of direction to follow. But worse than that is the games that they have made out of it. Now your neighbors, your family, your friends or not friends can actually suss you out and can actually evaluate what your behavior. It's a game, it's presented as a game, but basically what it does is it, it eliminates the need for a lot of policing. We're having a new self-censorship kind of system. So that's a very strong, very strong issue. Here was my argument about uh, the loss of the referent. The loss of referent in alternate truth. Remember, it's been, <laughs> it's been described, I read recently, that the famous alternate truth, which was the fact that at the opening or the, in the, the inauguration of Donald Trump, there were more people in the mall of Washington than, uh, than for Obama, was actually ordered by Trump himself. He actually asked to redesign the actual number of people that seemed to appear on that thing, faking absolutely that news. So, there we are, the conflation of the subjective and the objective, when you can actually not care at all about the reference, at all about what's going on, simply make the statement and declare it truth. So, from the official blurb that introduced me to the theme that we were talking about, is from the Arts Electronica, in a media scape where the average user couldn't care less about the veracity of the sources, who is responsible for regulating the distinction between true and false? What's art got to do with it? Anyway, that's, that was the point. The idea is that art is supposed to help us out, and maybe it will. And maybe you will not agree with my definition of art in this particular case, but I was fascinated to learn about this program invented by a woman called, um, I forgot her name now and I didn't put it up there. Doesn't matter. Uh, Replica is a system, or it's a, it's a software, that allows you to create a companion who will respond to your characteristics and will engage and learn with machine learning more and more about you so that the kind of conversation you engage with will actually become more and more uh, relevant to you. How did this happen? This woman lost her friend and he died and she was already working on a software that would allow people to create their, a, a kind of companion. She took the very large database of exchanges that she had with that person in order to process that particular kind of sensibility that corresponded to him. And so she then started doing this in, a, in order to somehow have a, a more intimate memory of the man that she loved. But eventually, and this is where the art side of it becomes a little bit tricky, uh, it became much more of a commercial uh, system, and you can actually download Replica, and you can start your own friend, and two million people have already done it, so you'll be in, in good company. Uh, yeah, here's her name, uh, Eugenia Cuida. Uh, now, other systems like Wobot, the Chatbot, and so on, uh, have, have uh, appeared after that. I am your artistic replica, you can decide later whether that's correct or not. But I have another, I have another <laughs> statement to make here, which probably will make me never invite at that Ars Electronica again, because this is popular culture, of course, and can we consider it as an art form? Absolutely. And particularly an art form around error. How many of you have seen anything from Black Mirror? All right, so... We have a cultured audience here. Why do I consider Black Mirror an art form? Well, it's, a, it's very much around the idea of an error that actually is like the hubris of the old tragedy. And in fact, our cinema productions is all about Greek tragedy. It's all about our problems. It's all about actually airing in the public the kind of situation that happened in the, in the context of our actual history as it's unfolding. 
So here you see uh, on, the on the top left, uh, it's an attack of drones, and there are bees, but the fact is, it's real because there are people making those bees now, not to attack people, but to actually replace those which are not pollinating anymore our, uh, our flowers. Uh, on the right, self-driving cars. We have a case of an accident with a pizza delivery and, of course, all the consequences of that. Uh, on the right, probably the most prophetic one because it came before the uh, plan of China was known, this woman goes to her room by being totally obsessed, as many of us are, uh, myself included, by the ratings or whatever it is that people think about you on her system, uh, cell phone. Uh, and then she ends up being absolutely ruined by this. On the left of the error, you have the woman who has, and this is again very much like replica, this woman's husband just was killed in a car accident because he was watching his <laughs> cell phone instead of driving. Uh, and she too is, uh, receives a message from a company that tells her, we can reconstitute for you the sensibility and the personality of your husband. And she goes, well, sure. She starts, she does uh, start going. It's wonderful at first. Yes, it seems to be really him. But the next thing, a body in plastic is brought to her house, and that's the body of her husband. And that body is capable of moving like a person. And so she starts living with this person, and again, it seems okay, but there's something missing. Anyway, I won't just spoil it for you. Go ahead, go and see it. Uh, on the, on, at the bottom, you have a man totally obsessed by our virtual reality. Uh, that's banal, but never it is. On the right, you have a horrible machine, which is uh, uh, one of these robotic dogs that instead of doing its, do uh, its, uh, its dog uh, work of uh, protecting the house, is actually uh, sussed on to a person and keeps running after that person. It's absolutely horrifying. So the point is, when we're dealing with uh, algorithm ethics, ethics rather, uh, what have we got? Who's helping on this matter? Well, we know the formal one. The formal form was Isaac Asimov. You know, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given by a human being unless it conflicts with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as the protection won't conflict with the first and the second law. That's the basis from which very many new kind of, I'd say, a draft, uh, principles have been uh, driven. Uh, the Korean law adds something very interesting. Robots are afforded the following fundamental rights. The right to exist without fear of injury or death. That's pushing it forward. You know, it's a machine after all. The right to live in existence free from systematic abuse. Another very interesting question. We, we can understand this for dogs. Do we understand this the same way for robots? Then you have 10 uh, principles, which I'm not going to go through because there is a lot more. There is principle for accountable algorithms and a social impact statement of, for algorithms. Responsibility. Who has responsibility? Explainability. You have to ask your system, your algorithms, to actually explain themselves. Uh, accuracy. Be clear on what they do and what they cannot do. Auditability. You can submit your algorithmic uh, process to an auditing service. And of course, fairness. And it goes on. Here is the uh, Association of Computing Machinery, Principle for Algorithmic Transparency and Accountability. And then it goes on. Here is Bertelsmann Stiftung. And then here it goes on again, as we as you will our AI principle. So we're not alone. Obviously, we are, we, are, we are getting some help. But then when you think about it, you ask yourself, what can be programmed and what can't? What can be monitored? So Asimov's, Japan, South Korean rules, distant early warning reports, reports on data source and procedures used, all that can be somehow programmed and you can actually get away with your artificial intelligence. But what can't be programmed is judgment. I don't care what they say about decision supporting uh, systems. It is not ever going to be able to replace human judgment. Feeling. I know we are putting, you know, effective computing in course and so on, but I don't trust, uh, you know, anything but a system of simulation. Self-awareness, yes, they talk about self-awareness of the, of, of the artificial intelligence. Well, it's, it's true, it's, but it's only on the basis of internal scanning of the functions as they, are, as they are proceeding. So I don't trust it. And more than anything else, I don't trust the spontaneity, except, of course, from unpredicted 
behavior. So my last statement, and I don't have a slide for it, but is for the artists in this room, you are, and we heard again from the Commissioner Viola, uh, the suggestion that art could be helpful in this particular case, you are now responsible for dealing with artificial intelligence and uh, algorithmics, uh, algorithmetics because, in fact, you will know better probably the human effect of this, and in fact, the, the role of art is to predict the effect of technologies as they're coming in our life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, after these two academic talks, I propose that for further thinking about AI and uh, art, that we ask the artists. And our first artist is Chris Salter, um, also partly uh, uh, at university, a research chair in new media technology and the census at Concordia University, and the director of the Hexagram Network for Research Creation in Media Arts, but also um, artist and um, active in various exhibitions, conferences, um, and finally an author of um, books Entangled, Alien Agency from MIT Press. When you're ready to go, I give you the word. Thanks. So, um, I'm going to continue with this idea of artists saving the world. Um, but this actually will be a bit of an academic talk because I wear different hats. Um, so I'm going to wear the hat first of all as an academic and then as an artist, or maybe vice versa. Um, so I want to propose a simple question to you, which is the following. Uh, what kind of self are we in the process of becoming in a world in which autonomous processes actually create new understandings? of us as selves. Uh, and then the second question is, what role do the arts, but not only the arts, but the relationship between the arts, the social sciences, and the humanities play in responding to this issue? And I want to start off with um, this image here um, about the discipline of, of behavioral biometrics. So behavioral biometrics, if you don't know, uh, is a, a technique that basically monitors your actions uh, and to create databases of those actions. Um, and there's a recent quote in Forbes magazine, the American uh, Business Journal, which stated, in the world of behavioral biometrics, machine learning, deep learning, and artificial intelligence are all going together hand in glove. Now, as most of you know, biometrics, of course, is the capture of your biological signs, your fingerprint, your iris, you know, in an airport, um, you know, your face, uh, but these are all static characteristics of humans. So behavioral biometrics goes to the next step. The next step is basically to capture dynamic things. So for instance, um, one company called Biocatch claims it could capture up to 2,000 parameters from your use of a cell phone. So for instance, you're toggling between fields, the way you turn the phone in terms of its acceleration, um, basically your hand gestures, the pressure when you type, and of course, the amount of information and way you interact on certain types of online applications. Now, what this essentially accounts for is essentially building up a database of continuous actions. That is, your human gestures can actually be tagged and tied to your devices. Now, the idea with such a technology is to create kind of an individual gestural portrait of each person, but there's a problem with that. The problem is, is that people are actually not machines. They work in unpredictable ways. As Forbes says, there's no magical or fixed set of behavioral parameters that are used consistently to tell people apart. So we have this interesting problem. Now, the last sentence uh, is really critical because what basically this technology tries to do is find an optimization of your actions, okay? The optimal set 
for an optimized user, right? So tagging your optimal set of, of gestures and behaviors to your, to your device. Now, of course, as some of you know, this is one of the desires of statistical learning, or, or also known as machine learning, which utilizes these statistical processes. So for instance, trying to fit a line to data in regression, or a correlation, or dimensionality reduction, or clustering, to try to knock out the outliers and to find a predictable path and profile of a kind of set of behaviors. Now, this sounds really radical. Um, but actually, it's a pretty old idea. It's based on a model um, pioneered by economics in the 19th century uh, called Homo economicus, literally economic man. Now, what is economic man? Well, economic man is the assumption that human beings are rational creatures and seek optima. We seek to optimize our behavior, and in economics, our preferences, what we choose, one thing or another, our utility, so to speak. So most of these models of optimized human behavior um, are based actually on a much larger ideological assumption. And that is the following. That is the idea that by quantifying our behavior uh, and our experience, we can create more accurate understandings of ourselves. Okay? Now, this, of course, sounds shockingly anti-humanist. But in fact, if you look back in history in the 19th century, economics, phys physiology, psychology were disciplines that emerged to actually uh, investigate and explore this point. They actually believed that it was an enlightened approach to create these quantified portraits of humans. This is an interesting image. Um, it's from the Cambridge Expedition of 1898. This was an anthropo actually one of the first anthropological expeditions uh, that took those disciplines, economics, physiology, psychology, and brought an entire crew of anthropologists, scientists, psychologists to the Torres Straits, which are between Queensland and New Guinea, to essentially measure the senses of the natives there. Okay? So they wanted to test reaction time. They wanted to test physiological data. They wanted, this is an image of testing color. Uh, so they basically wanted to create these sensory profiles in order to classify these natives statistically. Now, this seems preposterous. And of course, in post-colonial context now, it's, it's, it's almost racist. But in fact, um, it's pretty standard. Ian Hacking, who's a Canadian anthropologist or historian of science, has a term for this. He calls it making up people. Now, this is a very interesting idea. Hacking basically said, with the invention of statistics in the mid 19th, or the end of the 18th century, early 19th century, that essentially tools were developed to classify people. So he says basically there were techniques like counting, quantifying, correlating, medicalizing, biologizing human beings. And, and what these tools did was, so quote, create new kinds of people that hadn't actually existed before, okay? So this is this weird idea that by creating some kind of categories, you actually invent something new. Now, this idea of making up people today goes by the term pretty much data science, right? Machine learning, predictive analytics are integral to something like behavioral biometrics because these rely on statistical procedures to pick out these patterns and these massive sets of data and to cluster and analyze and, and essentially classify them, right? So this is about classifying human beings. So in many ways, even though we think we're in the AI revolution, a lot of these ideas actually date back to the 19th century. Now, all of the current interest in AI, for instance, in these applications like behavioral biometrics, has to do a lot with securitization, right? Protecting your data, protecting you from fraud, um, from you know, Russian hackers who might you know, break into your cell phone and, and, and these kinds of things. But I want to actually question the my or our about what this data is. Because if I say my data, that assumes I have a stable self in which that data belongs to, OK? Now, if you look, however, at these new technologies, if you look at these kind of statistical procedures, we actually find the total opposite. We actually find that more and more, there is no notion of a body, there is no notion of a subject, 
and there is no notion of a self in these systems. Okay? In fact, to view ourselves as a statistical measure suggests that we can actually be perceived less as a human being and more like a bundle of properties that's con constituted at specific points in time and therefore changes, right? So it destabilizes some understanding of a stable notion of a self. Um, here's an interesting quote on Fitbit site from Fitspiration, don't compare yourself to others, compare yourself to yesterday. Right, so we don't want to compare ourselves to other people, we want to think about comparing ourselves to ourselves. Now, what's interesting is in the context of this whole festival, and in terms of the notion of error, is that more recently, they've done lots of studies on, very, on a lot of these fitness trackers, and as Fitbit as well, and discovered that about 60% of the data produced by them is false is subjected to error. So this is very interesting. If we believe in statistics, like many people do, we believe actually in the fact that we're constructed of these errors. But if we can be numericized and optimized as the case goes, then something actually more profound might be happening, which is rarely talked about, but I think it's interesting to think of, think of which is that we actually might start to conceive ourselves as anew right, as entrepreneurial kinds of selves. Now, economists um, have a name for this, and, and probably many of you know it, they call it human capital, okay? So human capital is this idea made popular by the Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker uh, in the 1960s, actually, that um, we invest in ourselves in order to influence our potential earning in the future. So this includes where we go to school, picking the right university, learning new skills, or even you know, having new implants to basically make ourselves more attractive. You know? So these are all the ways we invest in ourselves. Now, a human capital is also, of course, a cornerstone of an ideology, or let's say a political ideology that I don't need to say much about because we're in Europe, uh, and of course it's neoliberalism. Um, and neoliberalism, one very good definition from the economists Philip Murawski is that neoliberalism constitutes the dismantling of the distinction between markets and the rest of social life and experience. So if basically we can dismantle this distinction, all things can be treated, of course, as markets, from breathing to making art to dying. Um, now, it's interesting because Murawski has this very interesting quote where he says, if you don't like the way things are looking, if you don't like this, has the state of the world got you down? Well, then you can create your own personal solipsistic economy, a fit virtual abode for your own fragmented entrepreneurial identity. That's the ultimate in self-reliance, which of course the, one of the ideologies of neoliberalism is that we become self-reliant, we shouldn't rely on other entities like the state or something like that. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the very kind of academic side of the talk. Now, in the last four minutes, we can ask the question, okay, now what will artists do? I, I think it's presumptuous, as now I'm speaking as an artist, to assume that artists are going to save the world, you know, especially when we're in the context of kind of m megalithic institution, corporate institutions like Google and Facebook, which immediately want to co-op anything that actually adds to critique within the machinery of late um, uh, techno-scientific capitalism. So, I guess I would just give a couple of things that I think how artists might respond to these questions. So the first is um, how to work with others, right? Now, for instance, there's a, a, there's a whole uh, discipline called the Social Studies of Science and Technology, Science, Technology, and Society, STS, which has done years and years of work on the context of standardization, measurement, and quantification uh, in cultural practices and in scientific practices. Um, now, artists are really, really good at challenging these notions of quantification, right? That not everything can be reduced, reduced to numbers because things operate in fantasy, in the imagination, in people's bodies that are not easily reduced. But I think that in terms of, I think, the larger panel discussion, 
is that we need more collaborations between artists and these experts in these humanities and social sciences field, like anthropologists, sociologists, who actually have done a lot of work on this because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. The, the second idea is this notion um, of revealing and it's the need to bring these hidden systems basically into uh, the public's eye. And of course, artists are very good at doing that. There is, there is a term in the sociology of science called the public engagement with science. And this is this kind of idea that um, artists work with scientists to create these kinds of illustrations of scientific ideas to communicate science to the public. But I would push it further. That's very demonstrative and illustrative. For for, for instance, like I was just talking earlier today with my collaborator Takashi Ikigami, and we are talking about how could you create, using machine learning or artificial life, um, a different sense of lived time for people that instead at the same time, the machine itself has to develop its own sense of time. So this sense of time, the sense of changing your experience uh, looking or feeling something um, in terms of your attention becomes really interesting because artists are very, very good at understanding the relationship between perception and attention. And the last thing I'll say is the question of the political implications of cultural practices. Um, and so I live in Montreal. In fact, down the street from me, Microsoft is building one of the second largest AI research labs in North America. And um, there's a huge debate in Montreal, which of course is the, one of the centers for deep learning research on ethics. Um, and while philosophers and ethicists, and I think this relates very much to what Derek was saying, philosophers and ethicists can really have these debates about ethics in discourse, uh, artists actually can materialize these debates in material circumstances. So it's a kind of thinking about like enacting an ethical quandary or a kind of ethics for the future in the present now. You don't just talk about it, you actually enact it. Um, and this, I think, is another way that basically culturally we can stem the tide of the kind of ever encroaching apocalypse of quantifying and optimizing ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is an artist, uh, Sputniko. Um, she creates film and multimedia installation work, and uh, that work explores the social and ethical implications of emerging technologies. She's currently associate professor at the University of Tokyo, um, and she was before at MIT Media Lab, where she directed the Design Fiction Research Group. To date, she has pieces in the museums such as the V&A and the 20th Century Museum of Contemporary Art in Kanazawa. I give you the word. Hello, we're getting the right connection, ready? So hi, I'm Spotniko. I'm an artist based in Tokyo, and today my talk's not so much about AI, but it's more about looking at, okay. So I have 10 minutes, right? Or 15 minutes? 15, okay. <laughs> so my talk's called Designing New Mythologies, and it's not so much about AI, but looking at the relationship between technology, mythologies, and beliefs. And um, the first project I'd like to um, introduce to you is called The Red Silk of Fate. And this is a project I've been working on from 2016. And how many of you here have heard of the mythology of the red string of fate? Unme no akaito. Yeah, I, I can see a lot of Japanese hands up. So it's a very famous mythology in Japan and China. And it's a myth mythology that says that two people destined to meet each other romantically 
have this invisible red string of fate connecting between them. So it's, it's a very, very old mythology, and it's obviously something that's only happening in fiction, or fantasy world, but as an artist, I was interested in trying to explore ways of using science to recreate that world of mythology. So what I, what I did was that I worked with Professor Hideki Sezutsu, who is um, a researcher at National Institute of Agrobiological Sciences. Oh, does the video play? Oh, the video doesn't play. No. <laughs> Oh, it's playing. Great. Can you see the video? So um, he's an expert on um, genetically engineering silkworms. So by adding the DNA of jellyfish and coral, you can make the silkworms' eyes glow red and green, and also the string, the silk that the silkworms produce, glow red and green as well. And basically, Professor Sezutsu, he he is sort of seeing these silkworms as almost like an uh, insect factory. So by adding a DNA that produces silk that has more um, spider web um, substances in it, you can make silk that's half spider web, half silk. So it has a very, very high strength. So I started talking with Professor Sejutsu. Okay, this, this is really crazy science, crazy technology. Oh, where did it? Where did it go? <laughs> Is the video not playing? No? Okay, that's bad. So, I was, um, yeah. So I started talking with Professor Sadutsu. So, wow, like, th this is really crazy technology that you have. And uh, is there anything that, um, any like projects that we could start to think about. And one idea that we started to talk about was that, have you heard of oxytocin? Oxytocin like, is like a social bonding hormone. So it's a hormone that's produced when couples are in love or if you're like, hugging someone. So I asked Professor Sezutsu, can you add a DNA that pr produces oxytocin, which is a social bonding hormone? and also add a DNA from a red coral so that you can make this silk glow red. So basically, in the end, can you make a silkworm that produces silk that glows red but contains this social bonding loving hormone, quote unquote, the red silk of fate? So I asked Professor Sezutsu, and he looked pretty puzzled, a bit surprised. But after a bit of thinking, he told me, ah, actually, it's really possible to genetically engineer silkworms that produce silk with oxytocin and glows red. So the photograph you see on the left, this is the first red silk fate that Professor Sezutsu created and sent, me, sent to me by Gmail temp, uh, attachment. <laughs> so it's a bit blurred. And at this point, I was really amazed because I think I always had in my idea that new, new insects or new creatures, new living organisms is something that it's something that maybe humans don't design or don't create. Well, maybe it's changing now, but for an artist to imagine this kind of mythical creature and talk with a scientist and actually work together. And he, uh, it was only eight months after we had our first discussion that he managed to make this red silk fate. So I was really, in a way, it's difficult for me to say, like, maybe I was puzzled, maybe I was excited. It's that strange feeling of, did I do something really bad or did I do something really exciting? How is the world changing? when an artist can make something like this. So, actually, I also did an exhibition with the Glowing Silk in v &A Museum. So, we um, designed this like perfect killer dress with the oxytocin hormone. And anyhow, so the next slide is that the whole Alsa Electronica is about error, right? 
And I think mythologies and beliefs were often associated with errors. And science has long challenged and demystified the world of mythologies. For example, Galileo Galilei was put on trial for saying that the Earth rotates around the sun, and Darwinism is still not taught in so many schools in America. But I was really interested to see whether these new emerging biotechnology and also artificial intelligence, are they recreating a new world of mythology and beliefs, a new sense of how we um, believe in um, different things. And this is also a very famous cover of um, Time magazine, God versus Science. So as you can see, I think we all have this trouble between technology, science, religion, beliefs, ethics. And I really wanted to explore the troubles we have or the possibilities um, we have. And one thing um, I was thinking about is that I'm half British and half Japanese. So I was born and I grew up in Japan. And in Japan, we have, oh, Japanese people have this belief in infinite gods like animism and Shinto. And basically, um, Japanese people believe that there are spirits and gods in everything, trees, ocean, rocks, wind, uh, cockroaches, or a virus, or amoeba. Like, they all have different Shinto spirits in them. So I was interested in talking with Shinto priests about what they thought about these new emerging biotechnologies. So I went to visit Kanda Myojin Shrine, which is a very, very old shrine in Tokyo, 1,300 years old. And I talked to the priest and I said, OK, um, I just worked with Professor Sezitsu. We genetically engineered this silkworm that produces this red stringer fate, which is a very famous mythology in Japan. And is, well, what do you think about this whole project that I'm working on? What do you think about this whole science? And the reason why I asked Kanda Myojin Shrine is because they are actually famous for selling these IT protection spirits that protect your computers from viruses and crashes. <laughs> so if you pay a thousand yen, you can buy these little spirits that protect your computers from getting um, the viruses, so much cheaper than not an, ant <laughs> not an antivirus. So I was talking with them. So, hi, you know, you're such an old shrine with so much history, 1,300 years old. And why are you selling these spirits that protect your computers from viruses? And I got a very interesting answer from them. So in Japan, um, most people buy these protection spirits or amulets that protect you from car crashes, right? Omamori, jidosha omamori. But cars only appeared in Jap Japanese society in the last you know, 50 years, 60 years. But now, like, it's a very, very normal thing for people to have these protection spirits to protect you from car crashes. And as a Shinto shrine that lasted such a long time, the reason why we lasted so long is because we always worked together with the current society and technology. So we always sort of updated the way people believe Shinto, the way people um, participate in the rituals. So when I talked about this genetically engineered silkworm that produces this red silker fate, I was at first a little bit scared, like, would they be really annoyed with me, angry with me? But um, they said that, well, if that's a new living thing, that probably has a new Shinto spirit in there. And actually, that new silkworm is so interesting. Would you like to work with us to make a new love amulet, <laughs> like a love-supporting spirit amulet with us? So instead of being negative, they were actually open about taking that new idea in. So 
after that, um, I started to work on uh, this new mythology of, um, based on this story of Tamaki, who is this female scientist in the middle. So she is a genetic engineer, but she has a big, big crush on her colleague, Sachihiko. But Sachihiko, it seems like maybe Sachihiko doesn't really realize that she has a big crush. So she decides that, okay, if, the, if there's no red string of fate between them, she's going to genetically engineer her own unique red string of fate to get the heart of her crush. So while she does that, these strange Shinto power start to come into her, and uh, very strange things start to happen to Tamaki. So I'll, I'll show you the video. And also, I'm a musician. I sing, so the video is a music video, so I wrote the song, I'm singing, and I'm also playing Sachihiko in it, so I'll play this. It has sound. Can you play sound? Can you play the sound? No sound? <laughs> There's no sound. Yeah. You know, if you don't get... Okay. Okay, enjoy. It's super J-pop, but I, I, I like J-pop too much. That's a real professor Suzuki that I work with. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I want to show you the whole video, but. <laughs> If you want to see what happens to Tamaki, please go to YouTube and search for Spotnik Girl <laughs> Red Soccer Fate, <laughs> please. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah, it's, you can see the whole video on YouTube. And, oh, shall I show it? <laughs> Anyhow, so I created a video, but not only that, I worked um, together with uh, Naruse Inokama Architects to build probably the first shrine that worships a genetically engineered animal. So this is a shrine that's in Teshima. And Teshima, that's an island 
next to Naoshima. Naoshima is like an art island in Japan. So um, we created these charms and um, these um, boards where you can write your wishes. And um, it's a romantic shrine. So this is the boards that you can write your romantic wishes. So these are what it looks like. And inside the shrine, we made it into like a DIY bio lab. So it's not just a shrine, but if you go inside, you can see how Tamaki was imagining this new red stringer fate and how she was working on um, this new world of mythology. So how, how many more minutes do I have left? Did I, did I go over? Did I? Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> All right, so thank you. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Anna Maria Brunhofer. She works at the interface of business and creativity, focusing on contemporary technologies. And she has a background in economics and ethics, fashion design, art studies, and philosophy, which gives her um, an approach that she calls holistic, um, which is very useful for teams uh, we're talking about today. So when you're ready with your setup, um, please go ahead. So thank you for the introduction <laughs> and thank you for the invite to this exclusive panel about um, art and science and artificial intelligence. And when I was invited to make a talk about the creative AI landscape, the first thing I did, I, I googled it. I googled what is the creative AI landscape and what does it mean currently. And what came out? in this 10 to 15 minute talk is a critical review about current expectations, what creative AI is. So, Googling from the start, Googling the creative AI landscape. This shit up. Um, it's a chart brought to us by Luba Elliott and Peters again. It shows us a very interesting overview of startups and companies that are working on, well, maybe they would even say disrupt AI strategies for the mains out of the creative economy. As every chart, it doesn't aim to cover all companies and products related to the creative AI landscape. And then again, how should it? Each week, anywhere, anything pops up promising to either use AI or simple have AI in the name. And economically, and economically very promising and already decent developed category is um, the one on the left. <laughs> it's the search and recommendation algorithms. They are mostly using text tagging, some may be using object recognition and key point tracking. So there we know for the most part which AI is behind it or which AI should supposedly be behind it. And we know that they work in the creative industry sector. But do we also find creativity behind it? I will just pick one uh, fast example out of the chart. 
where the outcome of AI uh, research made it at least very creative. Most of you know QuickDraw. QuickDraw, in QuickDraw, we may engage with an act that masters of design thinking would name the creative that lies in all of us. In just 19 seconds, you have to draw a doodle to a certain term, and QuickDraw tries to recognize the doodles and name it. It's part of the Google pair, people and AI research. Their mission is human-centered research and designed to make AI partnerships productive, enjoyable, and fair. That's interesting. That sounds like an approach to open AI for the goals of modern society, which could be collaboration, creativity, and fun. So far, in my opinion, it partly succeeded. It succeeded not because of QuickDraw had such great doodles in it. It succeeded because, not because of the systematization of pair that suggests that different cultures doodle differently. No, it succeeded because the funniest outcome is Draw This Camera from Dan McNish. Its object recognition app seems to be able to doodle as good as most of us can. It can because it uses the Quick Draw dataset, which is based on doodles of many not so much artists like me. Doing so, there are 345 objects that can be identified and printed, restricted by the 345 categories of Quick Draw. So, if you just wondered two slides ago what amount of time you could waste on Quick Draw, it's 345 to 19 seconds. <laughs> the object recognition only gets the AI nearest doodle. It is imperfect and has inherent errors in the picture narrative. That's what it's surprise and fun. And that's what makes it one of the most creative things done with AI, in my opinion. It's likeliness of errors. Another thing to waste time on the internet very creatively with AI is the new Chris Venezuela's online text-to-image generator. With an attention-generative adversarial network, Venezuela wrote a generator that displays phrases in real time as you type them. I don't have time to show it, but some of you are here with laptops, so just type in the URL and, and write the talk or something. They're really fun images. That's fun. And one might even feel like really wasting time on the internet in a very creative way. And on top of that, with artificial intelligence, it might also help to develop interest in creativity and in artificial intelligence, and that's a great thing. Yet, maybe let us stop here for a while and ask what those terms would mean. Did we already speak about creative artificial intelligence? So I am sure that you have read a little bit on AI, and you know the categorization of artificial intelligence into weak or narrow AI, strong or general AI, and the artificial superintelligence. Let's face it, currently, we are in the realms of narrow AI, solving a few problems on a very sufficient basis. We are on the best way to get on track with general AI, but we are way, way distant to the artificial superintelligence. The ASI would be defined as something we are not sure about yet. Saying so, maybe we won't be able to anthropomorphize the state of AI anymore by then. But supposedly, we will, because we are humans, and we are defining and reflecting it. It's the same when talking about intelligence. We think about intelligence now, but we are not even clear about what is it. When we're talking about intelligence, we assume the following. Historically, intelligence is a very human entity. We developed higher than animals around us because we are rational beings who can grasp and judge correctly. Already Aristotle saw this as proof for our, today we would say, intelligence. While narrow AI might master the factors of Louis Thurston's primary mental abilities, which would be space, perceptual speed, numeric ability, memory, reasoning, word fluency, verbal relations, it might be that the, super uh, that the artificial superintelligence is by then an extra form of intelligence, the same as some researchers are currently in the search for the definition of animal intelligence. And what's with creativity? 
When American psychologist Keith Sawyer published in 2014 that creativity is one of the most important points of what makes us human, it confirmed the concept of the demarcation between man and machine through the possibility of creativity. Creativity for many seems to be the last hope standing when it comes to the supremacy of human. AI seems to raise the question, what makes us human? Way more often than, what could be a great AI? Creativity itself, for example, can be defined as the act of creating something new. The new can also be merely a concept or an idea. It can be historically unique in its originality or just individually unique. Creativity can be purposeful. It can be also an artistic creativity that at the first glance doesn't seem to fulfill any purpose at all. In any case, it seems that creativity in our time is not over stylist anymore as it was when only genius got creativity. Rather, there are even systematized approaches to creativity. And an artistic creativity can too be classified as being purposed as it has been received for a short time now. It is pursued in order to be evaluated as good art and to reach an audience, to generate emotions for the idea and to communicate content. Let's look at some examples that are in the realm of artistic creative AI. The exhibition Unhuman, Age in the Art of AI, is one of these um, examples. Ahmed El Gamal designed ACAN, it's A-I-C-A-N, an AI algorithm that creates works which will be perceived as artworks. Created by Emily Spratt, the exhibition thus creates attempts to question precisely the issues of authorship and artistic creativity that may or may not be belonging to humans anymore. Another great example is Quasimodo. And I get a video in there. Or not, that's a screenshot. Um, Quasimodo is an arts festival alumni and better known as Mario Klingemann. In his works, material descriptions doesn't contain any oil on canvas anymore. It's like you see cycle again, again to again, and pix to pix when he talks about his works. So what could be, I, I, would, I would go over that because of time matters, and go to the last question. What could be essential to a creating creative AI if possible? In short, the answer may be as to all artists, technique, knowledge, the urge to create or to communicate, emotion, and the bravery to idiocy to break with it all. So I would love to see a neural network learning from an effective computing and realizing how the artwork, how the audience reacted on the artwork. The creative AI would stimulate some of the human's inherent needs by then. It's relatively close to the question of AI and friendship. Can we be friends with an AI? In some kind of way, we can, yes. Chatbots like Replica, we heard about it, and assistants like Alexa are showing us new kinds of relationships that are based on emotions towards machines. If you haven't done so, then please watch Beth Singler's documentary on that topic. It's online on YouTube. So this emotional infectiousness that you have with friendship is one of the most important criteria we do have for art nowadays, too. Another one might be the death of the Meister. What Harold Bloom's theory of the anxiety of influence is for poetry is the death of the master in art history. The student learns from his role model, the exemplary mentor idealizes, idealizes him or her and emulates. If the education is successful, he or she achieves equivalence. Then, the probably most important process is underway. The recognition of the structure, the overcoming of the superego paralyzing the creativity. Without this overcoming, no original creativity evolves. New creations can only emerge in break with tradition, with what has been learned. For strong artistic achievement, 
then the previous must be internalized, the structure must be recognized, and the imprisonment in the system must be ended in an unrepeatable way. This is the only way that original creativity can rise in this theory. In artificial intelligence, we are still far away from the death of the master. A neural net does not feel the urge of why and questioning. No inherent Schaffensdrang and the urge for continuous craving originality comes up. Still, maybe the closer we get to an artificial superintelligence, the sooner neural networks and algorithms like ACAN will be able to teach each other effective computing. And AI can and will master techniques. It has the knowledge. It will, be, will it also be able to develop an urge to realize emotions and react based on them, to further develop the artworks, and most importantly, will it be able to fail and break rules? If so, the real artistic, creative AI is born. What currently starts as a narrow definition and degenerates often into discrimination for sometimes could ultimately, once the patterns of masters are overcome, be a different kind of intelligence and a very different kind of creativity. Pablo Picasso, Alexander McQueen, Lil Michaela, that's the Lil Michaela, <laughs> the new star on the internet, and Casimodo. All of them try to learn the rules and then break them. That's something a real creative AI will want to do too. Thank you. <laughs> Speaker is um, Pierre Barrault, who is co-founder of um, uh, AIVA, an artificial intelligence company, who composes emotional soundtrack music. And the challenge, uh, he says, of his company is to try to establish this, this AI as one of the best composers of all time. So I'm very interested to hear what you have to say about it. Is it, is it working? Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Pierre. I'm a co-founder of uh, this company called Iva. And um, so I'm a musician. Uh, my parents uh, also are musicians. So my father is a film and music producer. My mother is a singer. Um, and um, as a child, I, I love movies, and I love soundtracks of movies. Um, and more recently, I've got exposed to the world of um, uh, music composition for soundtracks uh, and, and the, the sort of... Uh, the hardships of, of, um, of a composer that composes for soundtrack uh, music, uh, because it's, it's a very difficult job. And um, uh, I, I'm also a technologist, so I've studied uh, computer science at school, and uh, I've basically created this project with uh, a friend of mine from university and my brother, uh, where we wanted to combine both artificial intelligence and music composition. Um, so to give you an idea of what AI composed music sounds like, I want to do a little test it's called a music Turing test. So basically, I'm going to show you two pieces of music. And uh, for each piece of music, I'm going to ask you if you think this was composed by a human or by an artificial intelligence. OK, let's start with the first one. Raise your hand if you think this was composed by an AI. Uh, if you think this was composed by an AI, raise your hand. OK, I guess about 50% of the people here. OK, let's try uh, another piece of music in a slightly different style.
Okay, who thinks this one was composed by an AI again? Okay, same amount of people, 50-50. Um, so I kind of misled you because both of them were actually composed by an AI. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and this AI is, is called Iva, and I'm here to talk about, uh, to talk about this AI. Uh, so Iva, Iva it stands for Artificial Intelligence Virtual Artist, and uh, it's an AI that uh, I created with my team, um, and it, it's an AI that, that basically has learned the art of music composition by the reading over 30,000 scores of history's greatest composers, so the likes of Mozart, Bach, Beethoven. That's why the music that you heard is uh, mostly uh, symphonic music, uh, although the second one did have some Asian influence. Uh, and so I'm going to walk you a little bit through the, the training and, and so, sort of the creation process just so that you get an idea of how uh, an AI actually writes music. So. The first step is that uh, we take those 30,000 scores that I talked about and we encode them in a format that uh, an algorithm understands. So this is actually what a, a score of music looks like to an algorithm. So the, the white, I don't know if you can see up there, but the, the white patches are, are notes and um, the horizontal line represents uh, the time and the vertical line represents the pitch. And so this is one score of music and then this is what 30,000 scores of music look like. So enormous amount of data. Um, and again, very rich with uh, a lot of different composers that themselves have different styles and that come from different epoch. Um, so really, we, we're trying to feed uh, the algorithm a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, data. And so then the next step is that um, the algorithm is supposed to understand the, the patterns in those, uh, in those tracks. So uh, music is very rich in patterns. I mean, actually, that's, that's what makes music pleasing to the ears, because there's uh, patterns that we can hold on to. We can, uh, you know, uh, we can sing a melody because uh, it's repeated over and over again in, in a track. So uh, an, uh, the, the algorithm is basically, its job is to understand the patterns in melody, in the chord progressions, in the rhythm, um, and, and to create a model of that. And the way that uh, the composition aspect of the algorithm works is that, and trains, is that it takes uh, a few bars of existing music. So imagine the Mozart Requiem. Uh, so the existing uh, bars of music are represented by the white notes. And then it tries to predict what notes should come next in those tracks. So it tries to predict what Mozart actually wrote uh, following those few bars of music given as input. Uh, so when it gets the prediction right, the, the, notes are, the notes are green, and that's good. And when it gets the prediction wrong, it, the notes are basically red, and uh, that's bad. Uh, and over time, uh, during the training, hopefully the algorithm will get uh, you know, more green notes. Um, and, and then it will basically understand how, you know, how to continue a piece of music. Uh, during the, the composition process, we don't actually give uh, a few bars of music. We just give a single note in order to, uh, to generate uh, the rest of the track. Uh, but it's all very good to, uh, to create a piece of music, but actually uh, we found out that um, it's also very important to create the right music for the right person, uh, because if you, for example, if your uh, go-to composer is um, uh, John Williams, uh, but you very much dislike Beethoven, if an AI creates a piece of music in the style of Beethoven, uh, you may be not as uh, impressed by it as you, you would be if it composed something in the style of John Williams. Um, so basically, for that, we've taught another uh, system in our, in our AI to uh, understand the differences between different style of, styles of music. And so what, what you see on the screens over there uh, is basically a, a cluster of compositions. So each little dot is one uh, composition of music. And each color represents one uh, class of composer. So for example, blue is Beethoven and green is Mozart. And you can see that clusters sort of form uh, and, and pieces that are in the similar color tend to uh, gather together because the algorithm understands the difference between uh, you know, what makes a Beethoven piece so different from a Mozart piece. And so that, that understanding of, um, of different styles allows the algorithm to create uh, very specific music. So if, for example, someone wants uh, so, some music in the style of Mozart, we're able to emulate Mozart's style in the composition. Um, then the next stage is, uh, once the, uh, the music is, is composed, uh, we actually have a human orchestrate uh, that piece. So um, typically in, in, the, in the soundtrack business, um, when, when a composer writes a piece of music, they will either write for a piano or for a small uh, ensemble, or maybe they, they will write for a string section and then a brass section, but they will not say specifically which 
uh, instruments which should play what in those sections. And then the, they call upon an orchestrator to uh, sort of define the, um, the, the different instrumentation. So here a human is involved in the process uh, to define the instrumentation. Uh, and then once that instrumentation is defined, we can actually uh, either record that digitally with synthesizers, so what you heard before, or we can uh, actually take the scores uh, that were written by AI and take the scores to a, to a symphony, uh, to real people, and actually have uh, musicians play the music. So uh, that's what we did recently for a project where we were commissioned to create a piece that would be reminiscent of um, the soundtrack of a great composer. And um, so we took the, the scores to uh, an orchestra in Hollywood, and uh, we had the music performed by 80, uh, 80 musicians, and this is what they recorded. So this is, you know, I think that right now um, AI is capable of creating uh, scores. I would, I would argue beautiful scores, um, but that's not really the question for me. Uh, I think the more exciting part is that um, humans can actually take those scores and bring them to life. Um, and it all fits into the, the framework of um, technology augmenting uh, human creativity. And actually, as a matter of fact, in history, th there's been a lot of examples where technology has augmented creativity. So initially in the 19th century, um, live music was the most popular form of music because uh, there was no recording, there was no uh, CDs, there was no radio. Uh, so if you wanted to actually enjoy music, you would have to go talk to a concert that would be uh, usually reserved to uh, more privileged families. Um, and also uh, when uh, silent films first came around, uh, music was needed to cover the noise of the, of the projectors. Um, and the, the problem here is that, well, first, Access to live music was expensive, but also um, if you wanted to have a soundtrack for a film um, with, with like a symphony, that was impossible because there was no way you're going to cram uh, 80 people uh, of an orchestra into a small theater. Uh, so you were limited in terms of what music you could have in a movie. Um, but then music recording came around and allowed uh, filmmakers to, uh, to basically uh, work with composers to have original scores that are, that are tailored to each and every frame of their stories. So now when you go to cinema, you expect the music to be an enhancer of the story and to be almost sometimes part of the story. Um, so recording, uh, recorded music really allowed um, uh, you know, uh, creative benefits on that regard and also made music access much cheaper because then people could just uh, you know, listen to music on the radio as opposed to having to go to a concert. Um, and then another rev revolution came around, uh, the revolution of synthesizers, um, you know, this idea that you can play, uh, play a, a very unique sound, a synthesized sound, without having to play an acoustic instrument. And at first it was a bit shocking to some musicians because uh, people felt threatened by this technology. But actually, it turns out that uh, it created new styles of music uh, for people to, to, to write and, and compose, uh, but also it allowed uh, you know, people with no budget at all to be able to, to write and record music uh, from the comfort of, the, of their bedroom uh, without you know, needing a huge budget to hire uh, st studio musicians. So in that regard, also synthesizers were an enhancer of creativity because of the new style and because of the easier access uh, to creation that they allowed. Um, and I think that the next step is um, in, in, in music and in terms of a technological revolution in music is uh, going to be personalized music. So nowadays, there's a lot of interactive content, interactive storytelling with uh, video game, uh, VR content, uh, augmented reality. And all, the, all these content, they have hundreds of hours of personalized stories, uh, yet only two hours of music on average for a video game. Uh, that's for the very simple reason that uh, no human composer in the world can compose hundreds of hours of, of music. And, um, and it's, it's really sad because the same music loops over and over again, like 50 times on average, 
uh, and, and it leads to you know, less immersion and maybe less quality for, for the storytelling overall. Um, and I think that AI can really help in, in regards to those, um, to those uh, use cases where uh, human um, creativity cannot scale. AI can, can you know, help us humans scale our creativity and create more music and also uh, you know, take a step back and be able to almost play the role of the director and say, you know, I want this particular cre creative vision, I want to try this new idea, let, a uh, let AI uh, help me do, do that. Um, so I want to end on a good note and uh, play you a full piece of music because before I only played you snippets of uh, pieces created by Ava. Uh, so this one is called Blurred Frontier, and I hope you enjoy it. That's it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as a as a last uh, part, I've been asked to do a small wrap up talk to end. So um, my name is Mark Kuckelberg. I'm professor of philosophy of technology here at the University of Vienna, um, and. I do research on uh, thinking about robotics and AI, including also uh, policy. For example, I um, also I mean this high-level expert uh, group for the European Commission and at the Robot Rat here in uh, Austria. Um, as I said, I'll just quickly wrap up uh, some things and give my my uh, comments on them. So what I heard today is is. Uh, yeah, why do we need um, AI and, and uh, art? Why do we, what can we do with them? I think first um, kind of discussions that we had and, and talks was about how to, um, to better understand ourselves. So this is definitely something that um, AI could help us with in the first sense as in, um, yeah, it helps us to reflect like we're doing now, reflect on what is human, um, what is creativity also, but also in a more concrete sense, like um, we heard now music composed by an AI, um, it really very concretely makes us think about wh what is music actually and what is creativity. Um, I also wrote about this topic, about what is, what is art, what is creativity, based on um, what can we learn from this discussion about artificial intelligence. 
Also, in, in that uh, area still uh, was an important point that uh, we need to take into account a historical perspective. So for thinking about the future, it is very known that in the humanities at least that we need to also look at the past. And so many of the, the perspectives we heard go back to the past and see how the meanings uh, that have to do with artificial intelligence are actually, yeah, uh, that, that we can better understand what's going on by, by going back to the past, to the tradition also. But then uh, uh, the, the second area of uh, discussions were more concerns about ethics. Um, we should not replace the human. We should be aware that yeah, the quality of social relationships is uh, preserved. Um, we should not have um, AI instead of humans. But if we think about this, then it's also important to not needlessly oppose humans and technology. After all, the technology is made by humans. Um, and the technology is not totally out of our hands. We can have an influence on, on, on the technology. Um, so maybe the question is more like, yeah, how can we, can we have better lives, better societies with the technology? And then art and innovation, but also, as mentioned, the humanities and the social sciences are important to uh, help us finding better ways of living with technology. Um, I think there uh, it's important within academia to have more interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. For example, I've been organizing a conference here in Vienna on um, robo philosophy, uh, which is combining the uh, humanities with science and, and technology. Um, but also more generally, I think the medium of writing of words uh, is, is, is not enough. So we speak here, we discuss, it's very important. Um, people write books and so on, but we also need the, the, the material side. It has also been, been um, emphasized here that we need art also, and art can, uh, through, through material objects, also help us think. Um, and finally, um, as, as has been, uh, of course, uh, also uh, illustrated in the first talk, we, we need policy. We need policy uh, in order to, um, to help us um, to, to cope with the transitions that are awaiting us. Um, but this policy, of course, can only uh, be a good policy if it is based also on these first elements, a better understanding of AI and also uh, a more reflection on the, on the ethical aspects of um, AI and art. I will stop here with the talk because we had a long list of speakers, uh, but I propose that we have still a few minutes discussion um, so that you also have a chance to, to comment. Um, I start with uh, Mr. Viola, um, who can first give his comments and then we can open up the floor to the wider audience. Thank you. Do you want to um, take the stage? Or, yeah. Thank you. The art of imperfection. So thank you, it's really fascinating. I must say I've risen there two times saying it is AI music, so uh, I can still spot it. Uh, uh, it's for me, uh, my take, but then it's also a question to the other speakers is, uh, I don't think we can control it, stop it, uh, uh, get off of this bus. It's always like this, you said, in the history of mankind. Uh, then the question of, of all of, to all of us is, what kind of world we want? And the basic question is, do we want, and I come back to my first reflection, do we want a world where only the AI will play the piano, or still kids will go to school and learn music? Do we want a world where the mm, various uh, uh, mm, fake news generators in the net will generate uh, stories, or we want to have a critical mind and a critical understanding of the world around? Uh, I think what we are saying is beautiful, and I'm a technology gig. I like, I mean, uh, uh, whatever is new, uh, and I don't want to really think that this needs to stop creativity. At the same time, uh, we need to understand how to use it uh, in a way that this is not something that uh, goes in the other way around. I mean, uh, that creates a society without art, a society without critical sense, 
uh, we see signs around which are a bit worrying. I mean, uh, when you look at social media, for instance, uh, and when I look at the, the collective behavior, but also we see the signs in social media collective intelligence, which is a new form of intelligence which is emerging. So uh, it's a question to all the panelists. Are you kind of balanced uh, these two things, the very scary outlook of a society without uh, uh, people thinking, and the other one, a society that auments its critical stance and its forms of art by using technology? How you square the circle? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, who wants to comment on that from the speakers, but also from the, the audience? Of course, uh, I, my opinion is that we definitely need a critical society uh, that, that is aware of problems that, 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 that um, in a very um, open way discusses this. Um, what are your comments on... on, uh, on Mr. Viola's intervention, but also um, on wider on the debate that uh, spoke through the, the different presentations. Yeah. Um, I just really want to give an, uh, a comment very brief. So my opinion is really that I think from now, maybe in 20 years, there will some kind of tsunami be washed over us and then we will know how things turned out. I, I feel every one of us is very passive about the whole situation. I think um, technology development is not going on here, maybe in a, in, a, in a small amount of development, but we see Google and um, maybe Amazon or whatever taking the lead and we, we just, I, I mean, I feel very um, I don't know what to do with the situation. I'm very helpless in a, in, in a way. Yeah. yeah, sometimes we feel that some companies have a very, very much power over what, what happens, what will happen in the future. Um, okay, there. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's, um, it's about responsibility. So I'm feeling like, I'm feeling a little bit like the same and um, there are many Many problems we are we are faced, and there are environmental problems, there are social problems, there are pro problems uh, related to to globalism, and um, yeah, we didn't hear about much uh, about this, but um, Anthropocene, and um, I think um, we we should take responsibility for what we are doing and um, regarding responsibility for ourselves, but also for the environment, and if you're starting to um, take responsibility, then we can, we have a good starting point for changes, um, but this is something uncomfortable, and um, yeah, I think we have to face something uncomfortable, and this only works with a lot of effort, and uh, yeah, I think it's all of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. The question is always, we have to take responsibility. Who exactly has to do it, right? So, uh, is it also individuals, certain institutions? You had a question there also. A okay. uh, question or a comment which connects somewhat uh, the first and the second um, uh, comment. Um, I think we spoke too little about education. I don't remember. There's one of, one of the speakers who did um, speak about um, digital literacy or, or something. But I think that's going to be extremely important because when I, th when I look at the, the, the digital or the, the programs that are going on in the schools, it's about learning, like coding and things like that, but not about critical reflection of what's, what's coming upon us. And, and the grand challenges that um, the gentleman mentioned before, I mean, we have these huge, huge, huge challenges, climate change and all of that, health and all of that coming up. So that's also something that the next generation has to really address maybe with the help of AI. So I think that's going to be extremely important in the future. Yeah. Not only the skills to use things, but also the, I will say it again, because not only the skills to use uh, the, the IT, but, but how can we reflect on, on technology? How can we use it in a better way uh, in our lives and society? It's very, very, very important. Um, I think there was first a question there, and then... 
there in uh, the lady there. Um, actually, I wanted to kind of ask or comment on the two talks by uh, Beth Singler and Derek de Kerkhove. And, and it's something about the terminology, actually. Like, you're a philosopher, right? So when we're talking about like consciousness or also that uh, social cognition stuff that is in humans mostly done over like mirror neurons. So I look at someone getting hurt and I kind of feel a similar pain in a similar region in my brain. So I think that notion of social cognition that we have might be a term that is coined very specifically to human cognition. And, and so I'm always curious how, what do you think about like that being a kind of anthropomorphism that we put mm -hmm. to the technology for concepts that are very difficult to explain in humans to start with. And then we just like put it as a hat over the AI and say that might be consciousness or that might be something like that because basically mm -hmm. it might never be that. What do you think about that? Yes, well, what I think is that we probably need uh, new language, new concepts uh, to, uh, to uh, describe what it is, because if it's not human-like intelligence that we're moving towards, but other types of intelligence, we, we can try to find better ways of speaking about that, more precise ways. And you're very right that we need uh, to, to do that and to distinguish between um, different kinds of um, in intelligence. I have the last question here, and then we have to wrap up because of time. Um, you still had one. Yeah. Thank you. My question is about ownership and artificial intelligence, specifically directed to the Iva um, company. A few years ago, a monkey took the camera of a photographer, made a selfie. It was all over the world in, in the news, but uh, the photographer wanted to have royalties, but it was ruled that he can't because it was not a human who took the picture. So in your case, if the artificial intelligence is creating the music, is there an ownership or is it uh, in the open domain? How is it regulated? Thank you. Very good question. Um, so actually, Aiva is registered uh, as a composer in uh, Authors' Rights Society uh, in South Seine in France. So uh, all the compositions are registered for copyright. Um, but also, I think that for the general uh, copyright problem with AI, I think we, we should um, you know, especially in, in the case of narrow AI, you know, my, what my company does is very, very, very narrow AI. If you gave the system a, a car to drive, it would obviously crash it into the, into the wall. Um, so I think for this type of AI, which by, by essence is supervised by humans, whether it is, you know, through the data that we give it or, you know, through, through different parameters or, uh, or just by the way that we code it, uh, it's, it's supervised by humans and therefore it is a tool. So I think that, uh, you know, just like when you take a picture with your camera, uh, the copyright reverts to the owner of the camera uh, and the person who took the picture. So I think that uh, that's probably how uh, at least I would think about the copyright problem with AI. Okay, thanks for your answer. Uh, unfortunately, because of time, we have to uh, stop here. But thanks, all speakers, and uh, thank you for the public to be here.